I'm happy to hear that. Okay, so three, two, one. Uh, Professor Peter van Roy, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, I've got a bit, I've been reading your books for about a decade now, and they've been very sort of foundational in in adjusting my mentality and, and approach to programming and how to reason things. You take a, a view on programming from well paradigms and concepts versus sort of language level features and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's great having you on. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So programming, computer programming, is something that has been always very fascinating for me. So I was really lucky to be part of a group of people working with Gert Smolka, Hassan Aikasi, Saif Haridi in the 90s. All of this stuff is from the 90s, who were really interested in um, defining programming as really, really broad. So, and then, and organizing that. So um, for example, Gert Smolka is, has the most well-organized mind I've ever seen. He tries everything th that, that you find. He tries to organize it very clearly. Whereas somebody like Hassan Aikesi is like a poet. He has all kinds of beautiful structures. And then he's complaining that Gert is, is taking Sing them that. all apart and <laughs> making them all very simple and clear and so on. So I was in the middle of that. And so we eventually, in 1999, I was sitting in uh, Seif Haridi's office in Stockholm, and we somehow realized, we said, we actually know something about programming now after these so many years. We could write a book on programming. Yes, let's write a book on programming, okay? It'll be very easy. Uh, we just have to take all the stuff, all the manuals, staple them together, and we have a book on programming. It should be trivial, right? So, okay, so we started doing that, and then we realized, of course, it took a lot more time. So it took four years to write this book. So I have this book, uh, Concepts, Techniques, and Models of Computer Programming. Yeah. So this book is um, sort of distills all of our insights on programming. It organizes things in different paradigms and layers, and each paradigm is a useful way, So which I'll explain in a minute. But So we started that in 99. And uh, it was basically done in 2003, so it took four years. Oof. And then uh, the book came out in 2004, and it was completely exhausting. So I actually, uh, it took me years to recover from that, okay? So I had PTSD a little laptop. going there, right? <laughs> oh, it's terrible. I had a little laptop. And whenever we would be doing something, I would bring my daughter to do some physical therapy, and I would be sitting in the car working on the book, okay? So I was doing that for four years. So I was totally exhausted, but the book turned out pretty well. Uh, and, um, and actually now it, we're 17 years later and it still holds up. So I'm really happy. We tried to make it timeless and not limited to, to um, fashionable things because programming is very fashionable and there's schools of programming. So there's a lot of insights. So for example, on functional programming, you know, there's yeah. it's like a religious school of functional yeah. programming. Right? <laughs> yeah. There's a functional programming conference. So we really understand, we took, we really got a good understanding of that. For example, a functional program can be concurrent. You can have multiple agents talking to each other in a deterministic way. So wow. even though concurrency is non-deterministic, you have a scheduler choosing threads, okay, that's inherent from concurrency when you have threads. Still, because the paradigm is functional programming, the result is still always the same, because that's pretty amazing, mm. okay? So the concurrency is, is not observable, okay? So this is in the book. Because and this it's is cooperative, a, right? Uh, yes, it's yeah. cooperative. So mm. you can have, for example, like pipelines. But people know this already, huh? Like a pipe in Unix is like this, huh? Yeah. You have two processes talking to each other. It's completely deterministic, but it's concurrent. But you can make this much more general with lots of things happening, and it's all functional. And so I was really surprised that a language like Haskell does not do this. It's not, it's not concurrent. It's just doing lazy evaluation, which is basically co-routining, huh? which is not right. concurrent. There's only one thread of control, which is going from one piece yeah. of the context switching over there but it's quite and i'm quite interested in how you actually sort of discovered that um you know this declarative concurrency how did we discover that yeah, yeah, yeah actually yeah. we discovered that by right when we were writing the book we were organizing the paradigm so we have this kernel simple kernel language and we add concepts to it and this makes chapters in the book 
Yes. So at some point, there was a hole. There was a part which was empty. So we had functional, standard functional programming. And on the other side, we had concurrent, uh, stateful, like message passing. And there was a hole. What happens if you add concurrency to pure functional programming, but not state, just concurrency? So that, that was like a new thing. So we go, oh, what is this thing? So this was not in the original design of the Oz language. Huh? When it came up because we were writing the book. So we were going concurrent, just use concurrency added to functional programming, but no mutable state, which is not functional. Okay. So we'd found, we'd, we started exploring that. We go, this is actually really an interesting paradigm. Okay. So we, we, we put it in. So it was basically a hole in the book because of that hole. And then we, we did not invent this. Huh? This was actually known since 1974, Gilles Kahn's work, Kahn Networks. And it was dropped for many years because, because exactly because it's deterministic. People said, well, yeah, you can't do like client server non-deterministic in this paradigm. Oh, I see. So it's too limited. Oh, so I it's see. Focus. So let's oh, use monitors and actors instead. Okay. So it was just a matter of going down this, this alleyway and then just opening the door to like this, this is, you know, like this massive yeah. world beyond this door. Basically. Yeah. But the point is that we didn't, this was already known since the seventies, but it was, but it was forgotten because it was not a general paradigm. Mm -hmm because it was deterministic, functional programming is deterministic. So people forgot it and they started doing CSP and multi-agent actors and monitors and Tony Hoare stuff. That's real concurrency, right? Real men concurrency. Whereas deterministic concurrency was a limited form of concurrency. So it was kind of forgotten for decades. Oh. But that's, ter that's, that's actually very weird because it's very powerful and very often that's all you need, this deterministic concurrency. You don't need the general, the general concurrency is very hard. You know, people think concurrent programming is very hard and that's yeah. justifiable, huh? you know, <laughs> concurrent programming is hard, right? You want to prove correctness and stuff, but not the deterministic concurrent programming. That one is easy because it's exactly like functional programming. It's not, there's no deter non-determinism. So we actually called it concurrency for dummies, okay? Uh -huh. It means you can add threads wherever you want to your functional programming and it's still correct. Without even thinking, just add threads wherever there's a blocking of something blocking, just add a thread. You know, it's a little bit slow, but actually not that slow, but it's still correct. You cannot break your program by doing that. Mm. That would not be true in Java, okay? <laughs> or even in Erlang. So, so we, in some sense, rediscovered that deterministic concurrency and even the functional language community like the haskell the scheme people they don't do that but which is very weird didn't All alice alice, power, alice alice implemented that wasn't it yeah but that's it's um which you're talking about alice ml which yeah, that's right that? alice ml yeah which is um which is basically done by gert smoker which is actually oh that's uh, right he was in a, he was the uh, guy yeah. who did Oz. okay so right. Alice ML is a direct successor, but it never got as successful as Haskell, for example. Huh? Mm. So Haskell was this big, super successful thing. All the mathematicians are doing that category theory, blah, blah, blah. But it's not concurrent. And then they invented concurrent Haskell, but they threw everything out with concurrent Haskell because it's just regular stateful concurrency. It's not functional anymore. Come on. I mean, these guys are supposed to be um, so pro purity and then they throw out purity when they want concurrency i was always boggled by that okay because you don't have to throw out purity you don't at all so that's chapter four in our book okay and you can even combine it with laziness it's actually yeah. not the same thing as laziness so if you have a purely functional sequential language you can add laziness to that and you get haskell okay which is laziness is like co-routining huh right but there's only one thread of control in laziness. Huh? But then you can also add threads, which is an orthogonal concept to laziness. Mm. So people, they don't get that. But if, if you look at it, if you look at chapter four, you will understand that. So you can actually have both laziness and concurrency, which Haskell does not have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you can do really nice things that you cannot do in Haskell. You know, you cannot write 
a bounded buffer in pure Haskell. You cannot, because it's concurrent. If you have a, a buffer between producer and consumer, yeah. the point of the buffer is that you let the producer get ahead. It goes farther. Uh, and then, so it fills the buffer and then the consumer can pick the things whenever it needs. But Haskell will not let you do that because the laziness only computes when you actually need it, not yeah. beforehand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So in, in Haskell, you cannot do that. Whereas if you have both lazy and concurrency, you can do a bounded buffer and it's still purely functional, but you have a slack. The producer can go ahead, fine, yeah. but it's still functional. Mm. Okay, so this was a really nice discovery. This was maybe one of the most important discoveries we made. <laughs> and it's still not widely recognized in the functional community, okay? But you've, you've, you've come to a point where you've actually seen something like, I watched a talk of yours online, I believe it's called, something, about, something along the lines of time is evil. And it was a bit of oh, a, that's a... That's a continuation of this. Of this. Right, okay. yeah, you've, you've sort of like, you've time stretched things to the very end where you've like almost like brought together distributed computing as well as the programming exactly. community so this is, together. So this is the next and step of that. I'd exactly. love to hear. I'd love to hear. So, so, yeah, so I can explain that. So why time is evil in distributed computing? So this was invited talk. <laughs> so just let me, did, okay. <laughs> let me put on and, my seatbelt. code beam, okay? Let me put on my seatbelt. And it's actually Peter. true. Actually, we connected it to Gnosticism. Uh -huh. Do you know Gnosticism? Well, Which is a, an early competitor to Christianity. Right. In the right. first century AD. And according to Gnosticism, the world is created by a kind of lower quality divinity called the demiurge hmm. kind of nasty divinity and the proof is look at the old testament the god in the old testament is really a nasty character i mean he's very very mean and oh I mean, terrible <laughs> look at the book of job okay so but then the new then the the uh, christianity christ is the good god so eventually the good god realized that he had this lower quality divinity was messing things up so we came to fix things so the world is two layers so we're sitting in this kind of lower quality world created by demiurge which has time so you have evolution and time whereas the real universe above that which is called the pleroma where the real good god is does not have time okay so so in some sense the pleroma is like functional programming whereas time is like imperative programming okay so so there was a connection to this but but maybe i can go look, give you kind of the intuition of it why time is evil the point is that so you know that functional programming can be made concurrent but it can also we can go one step farther we can make it distributed and the idea is that uh, a distributed system, so you have a program running on multiple compute right. nodes sending messages to each other, okay? And so that's by definition concurrent, but it's also like partitioned. Each node has a piece of the computation and they send messages. So if you take your concurrent functional program, which is like a big Lambda expression, okay? Yeah. And you spread it over many nodes. So each node has a piece of it. And then when the nodes have to talk to each other, they send a message. But the messages in the distributed system could be asynchronous. You don't know how long they're going to take. Yeah. But actually, that doesn't matter. Because in functional programming, you have this great result called the Church-Rosser theorem. Functional programming is confluent. The reduction order doesn't matter. The result is always the same. That means you can actually model a distributed execution with asynchronous messages and you don't know how long they're going to take. They might be slow, fast. So the reductions will be done in different orders, depending on the messages are slow or fast. Okay. But church roster comes to the rescue. The whole thing is still functional. So that means even with asynchronous messages, the distributed system is completely functional. Right. And deterministic. Now that's something that, Distributed systems people don't know at all. Okay, what I'm telling you now is something that's totally off the radar for these guys. Okay, that they and they because uh, they don't they don't know anything about functional programming about languages. But the fact that there's this very interesting kind of distributed computation which is purely functional, they don't know that. But it's very interesting because if you ask the question, well, if that's the case what's the difference between this 
functional kind of distributed programming and general distributed programming. Okay, how much of regular distributed programming can you do in this paradigm? What are the things you cannot do? Because in this paradigm, there is no notion of time, okay? A functional program, the result is always the same. It's a reduction from initial expression to final expression. Yeah. And uh, so basically it's in a sense timeless. It doesn't matter in what order things are done. Of course, you have to implement it on a real machine, so it takes time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the result is already inherent in the initial yeah. expression. Okay, so where, where does this model break down when you want to do real distributed programming? That's I.O. That's a really interesting question, okay? Is it in the I.O.? Y yes, actually. It breaks down when you want to interact with something externally during the reduction. So right. normal lambda reduction starts with an expression, reduces to the end. And there's no interaction with anything during that. Huh? But in a real distributed system, you have like you're typing, messages arrive, things arrive, things are done during the execution. So yeah. you're actually changing the execution because of interaction with the external world. Yes. So that's not functional. That makes it non-functional. Okay, so then you could say, okay, so this Makes model it more is imperative, right? Distributed systems, they interact with the real world. But actually, if you look at it, real distributed systems, they only have very few parts where you actually need this kind of interaction. So the example I like to use is client server. You have one server yeah. or node, you have a thousand clients, like Amazon. Uh, each client is sending mm -hmm. messages, doing orders, getting results. And they're all doing it non-deterministically. So you have this huge program. So the server has this huge database. Clients is like your browser. Millions of lines of code are running. But actually, there's only one point of non-determinism in this whole big system. Because the server could be completely deterministic. The database could be. The clients could be completely deterministic. The only part that's non-deterministic is that the server where it receives messages from multiple clients. Mm -hmm. Because it has to receive whatever client sends an a, a command first, it has to take that into account. So that depends on the message travel time. So that's non-determinism because it's not decided by the program. It, it's an external thing. Yeah. But there's only one point to that. So in this million line big system, there's actually only one piece, one small point where you actually need non-determinism, all the rest can be written in deterministic and it's a distributed system, okay? So, so conclusion that most real distributed systems can be written mostly functional, Yeah. okay? But distributed systems people, they don't know that. So, hey, so now I say, hey, I have to educate these guys because <laughs> functional programming is very powerful. First of all, it's deterministic, no race conditions, okay? Uh, real world distributed systems, they're, they're very messy. They do way too much mm. non-determinism, but you don't need all that non-determinism. So you could use much less, okay? Also, there's all kinds of tools. So the functional programming people will tell you, testing is a lot easier, yeah. maintenance is a lot easier. Okay, functional programming, it's true. It has lots of advantages, okay? But the distributed systems world is not taking that using any of that. But what, as I just said, it could, right? Oh, could. oh, Peter, it can get really nasty in a distributed world. They do things Absolutely. like, you know, micro microservices and all sorts of stuff. Absolutely, and it's, yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's, it's, it's a... <laughs> microservices. So microservices, the way, they're usu the way usually services are done yeah. is that a service can receive input from any client. So a service, if you do it in the default way, it's a point of non-determinism. Yeah. Because each service can receive from, and you don't know which client is going to send. It depends on the message travel yeah. time. Yeah. So, but that's way too strong. That doesn't have to be like that. Because most, most of the services that are internal to a big microservice thing, huh? the services talk to each other. Most of those services, they know exactly who's going to be sending them the message, the next message, okay? Because they're talking to some other right. thing or a database or whatever, or there's a whole pipeline of them. So you're introducing all this superfluous non-determinism. Each service is written as if anybody could send it messages. When it but, didn't need uh, to be that way. 
But most of the services will not actually be used like that. Only a few, only the ones talking to the external users like me when I'm using Amazon. But the internal services will almost always be totally deterministic. They right. will know exactly who is sending them the next message. Right, right, but they're right. not written like that. They're written in a way as if they were non-deterministic. So it's got huge amount of non-determinism added in there for nothing, okay? So it's totally badly designed. And this is the way microservices are done today. They're it's completely a, it, badly designed. Okay? And it's absolute nightmare to this, debug. But I'm telling you, people don't know this, okay? <laughs> So, so amazing, huh? How such a huge, glaring fault def uh, problem just is no brain used all the time in today's distributed systems. Amazing, isn't it? Some might argue that programmers might want that scenario because they get paid to do the job, you know? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, it, it gives them a job security, right? But I think many programmers, they would like to make their life easier. Huh? I agree. Because you don't have to spend their time testing if the system is not is deterministic. Yeah. And if the services would be written deterministically. Yeah. So you know, then you could you could for, you could do many things. You could the testing would be much easier. Okay? Right. Because testing, if the system is deterministic, is it's not exponential. It's just additive. You can test each component separately. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so it's much, much easier. So I've got a next question is um, a, a follow up to this is a, a friend of mine, um, actually the interview number one by the name of Sebastian, he runs a company which essentially does control systems for ion traps. And what they're looking at is they want to create a, a distributed um, a scenario where you've got a number of different uh, control systems all talking together and they aggregate all the experiment information together. And uh, they're, they're currently using message passing at the moment. And, yeah. and I think as Sebastian knows enough that this is a, <clears throat> it's not working out that well. Right. So, so he's been, we've been having uh, you know, beers and busy talking about this and oh. I've been introducing this concept of, you know, uh, what we're speaking about now to him. Okay. Um, so it, it, they're, they're, they're quite likely might be a possibility of actually implementing something along these lines, although I'm not sure, but the question now is how, performant is this how performant could it be can it handle like uh you know uh, actually the whole high. thing is orthogonal to performance huh? uh -huh. so all the system that i'm telling you is yeah. as fast or faster than the today solution huh? well. i'm not paying any performance price for this whatsoever okay mm -hmm. on the contrary if you don't have to handle non-determinism you can do optimizations that you could not do if you have to handle you can, you can, the compiler, for example, can this shuffle true. things around and remove the messages. So pieces of code could be moved from one node to another. But the fact that you don't have to that's, uh, that's wait a very, for messages coming yeah. from many places, it allows much more optimization. So actually what I'm telling point. you, the techniques I'm telling you would improve efficiency a lot, even in some cases. So in your ion trap example, okay? So yeah. you have many different nodes, I guess they're measuring different parts of the system you're aggregating. So yeah. the idea would be that your measurement system should follow the structure of the physical system. So right. the physical system, in some sense, it, it's partly deterministic, right? Ions are moving. They, they, they pass by some detector, then another detector. So there's a lot of determinism there, right? right? In fact, so your measurement system should follow the structure of the physical system and all, especially that it, when it's deterministic, okay? So if I ever come to Hong Kong, we could, we could work, try to work it out with your friend, okay? <laughs> and, and, um, and the idea is that you would reduce latency by doing this, okay? See, all these points of non-determinism, they're all adding latency because you have to, your system has to be ready to handle things coming in from different places. So congestion, you would have to have techniques ready for managing yeah. congestion, even if yeah. you don't ever have congestion. So all of this would add latency actually. Yeah. So you have to be ready to support non-determinism even when it doesn't happen. So that makes your code more complicated. You have to add buffers, you have to add uh, flow management, whatever it may. So, uh, yeah. So no, okay. So how how does how does this uh, language um, 
face up in the in in the face of failure or errors you'd have to retry won't ah, you like? absolutely yep. failures mm-hmm. yes failures are the are normal so so okay so all of this you can see this as somehow uh the next step up from erlang okay the erlang that's, that's a pretty erlang lofty has... step there peter that's a pretty oh, but, lofty but, step but erlang has made made a very good step absolutely. although they're still too non-deterministic They, they are asynchronous and they assume that failure is normal, okay? Uh-huh. So a failure clearly is a source of non-determinism, okay? Wherever the system can fail, that's, that's something that's external. It's all of a sudden part of the system fails. So, so that's a non-deterministic choice that is imposed on you. So you have to be, when you design your system, the idea is that You only handle failure at certain points, not everywhere. Not, yeah. So the problem with Erlang is that all processes, Erlang processes, which can be very small, they ha- that you can link them and they can, be f- they, they can handle failure, okay? But that's too fine-grained, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want most of the system to be deterministic and you only want to handle failure at certain points. Or certain like subsections. One place, yeah. mm-hmm. so for each... computing nodes. So for each piece of hardware, right, right. in Erlang, you would have hundreds or thousands of processes running on the same right. processor. So you have way too fine-grained failure handling, actually. Uh, even though Erlang is very good, I'm not critiquing it, but we're going farther now. The failure handling actually only has to be done at the level of the, at, of the machine itself, and not right. internally. Internally, the whole thing could be deterministic. So the way to do failure handling is to make it much coarser-grained. So the problem, again, is it's, there's always the same problem. There's way too much support for non-determinism at all levels. So Erlang does it at very fine grain support for, so failure is kind of non-determinism. Right? It supports that. Whereas if you look at it in a nicer way, you can make most of the system deterministic, even with failure, huh? Because the failure can be handled at a much l- larger grain. Because failures, okay, they're normal, but they're still relatively rare compared to normal execution, okay? Uh, you don't want to have overhead for failure that happens once every million uh, cycles. You don't want to have overhead every thousand cycles. You want, yeah. to, have, you want to make it bigger grain, granularity right, right. for failure support, okay? So this approach works, will much improve the failure handling of your system too. Huh? Ah, fascinating. So, uh, so how, how, from, from, a, from a, a, a layered perspective, and I know you can do this, uh, I'm sure you probably designed this, this language from layers. How does, it, how does it look? If you could talk me through the process. I mean, has this language been implemented before? Well, uh, well Or, I'm talking to you about the Oz language, huh? Uh, Which, yeah, but, we'd, n- ah, but we'd, now we'd, I'm talking... So, so basically what you're saying then is that you just need to extend Oz so that you introduce the concept of a, a node which could be on the other side of we the world. That, huh? On the other side so of the world. We actually did that and it exists. And the problem is Oz looks very weird. So it has a weird syntax. But uh, even though it's in, the, in my programming book, yeah? so Oz never really um, made a big splash because it was... very weird syntax compared to, does not have C-like syntax, okay? <laughs> but, the, but the technique is not limited to us. You can do it in any language, yeah? You just have to be very careful of where you introduce non-determinism. So your language has to support that. So actually, there is a place where they're doing that. If you look at cloud analytics systems, they're doing exactly like that. They are mostly deterministic. starting from MapReduce. So MapReduce is actually a functional thing. You do map yep. and then you do reduce or fold. So that has a functional semantics and they implement it as on distributed system with hundreds of nodes. Mm. They can handle failures and stragglers and whatever, but it's still purely functional from the user point of view, okay? So all of the analytic systems coming after that, they are very similar. So a system like Apache Flink or Spark or whatever, they're mostly deterministic, okay? They know, because it's the only thing that really works if you want to do large parallel distributed systems uh, with all kinds of weird stuff going on, the only way that really scales up is the way I'm telling you, okay, which is mostly deterministic, okay? Right, right. 
even though, so, so the analytics people who make analytics tools, they know that intuitively. They have not said it as crisply as I'm saying it now, but they know that. If you look at the today's analytics tool, which is running on thousand nodes, for example, the only way you can make it run on a thousand nodes is if it's very simple, okay? Yeah. Uh, and, and simple means deterministic. So these systems are actually doing that, even though the languages that they're written in don't support that. So they have to force these languages like Java or, or Scala to be deterministic, okay? Right. So they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot at the language level to build this very nice, mostly deterministic system at the high level. So uh, in my view, the languages have to support much more deterministic execution. Right. So eventually, like in 10 or 20 years, people will realize that and their languages will support more deterministic things, okay? So what about what about a type system? Um, like I, I, um, I've been doing a lot of programming in Rust and I must admit uh, <coughs> types I have found to be very, very useful for me. Um, although it's got diminishing returns. I'm not, I don't subscribe to the whole thing like, you know, type the universe and, you know, everything, you know, like <laughs> types yeah. have uh, diminishing returns, like uh, in, in, in the sense of like, you know, being able to compile the entire program and see where the errors are and then going and fixing them. That helps yeah. ever so, so much. Type is type system is basically catching bugs at compiled time. Pretty much. Partial yeah. Verification. yeah. So a good type system actually helps you do that. Okay. Yeah. But it also restricts the system. It's less expressive. And you can't explore. I mean, you have to, it's like uh, a baggage thing. You have to do, you have to update the types whenever you update the system. So, so uh, for me, types is not really, um, you, you could use types to um, determine whether part of the system is deterministic, okay? Uh -huh. You could have a type system for that. Whereas the current type systems are not focused on that. I mean, Haskell type systems, well, Haskell is not concurrent, it's co-routining. So it's already deterministic because it's not even doing concurrency, okay? Uh, of course, it has a really nice type system, but what you want is a language like Erlang, or a, but even a Erlang++, which supports determinism and where the type system can tell you that you're breaking or not the determinism, because you want your program to be mostly deterministic. So the point is determinism, okay? So this is orthogonal to the regular oh, okay. user type system. Okay? So am, am, am I correct in saying that um, these languages like Haskell, they, they go so strict on the type system as to constrain uh, non-determinism as much as possible. Well, Can no, the Haskell no. by itself is already a deterministic language. Uh, I mean, so, so I'm not talking yeah, about concurrent yeah. Haskell, which is even not purely functional, uh, oh, right, which has yeah. mutable state and it is, it's very nasty. I mean, that's not, it's totally non-pure. So I'm not talking about that. I'm okay. talking about the pure subset of Haskell, the right. one that is supposed to be the, the holy grail of programmers, okay? Well, this one is deterministic, but it's not concurrent. Mm -hmm. So they throw the baby away with the bathwater. So my view is that has to be made concurrent and the type system should tell you whenever you leave the deterministic I subset. See. Okay. 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 So this is something that's not been done yet. It's because it's out of the scope. So on the one side, you have the functional programming community, which does not understand concurrency or distribution. Okay. Mm -hmm. They will argue with me, but I can push them to that because they do concurrent Haskell, which is really not a pure form. And on the other side, you have the distributed systems community, which understands nothing about programming languages. Right. They don't even understand that there's this beautiful functional subset of distributed systems that exists. Yeah. They don't understand that. Yeah. And I know that because I'm doing research in those two communities. <laughs> so my vision today is I want to build a bridge between the two. But that's very hard because they're very stubborn in not wanting to understand these things, okay? I tell them, da 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 da, da and they're looking at me like, like I'm on Mars or something, okay? I'm trying to, but they said, but, but if you write deterministic distributed systems, you can't model non-determinism. Well, duh, of course not. That's the whole point, okay? That you restrict the non-determinism. Yeah, but I want to do non-determinism. Of course you do, so do I but not everywhere. So they, they really try hard to not understand what I'm telling them. But eventually, eventually 
they will understand, and then they will say, "Oh, but we knew. We always knew this." Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, this was obvious from day one, clearly, <laughs> but it's not obvious to them today. As in yeah, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I found about Mozart uh, or ours was that it was, it was, you know, when you get like, when you start scaling up, when you're doing more serious, it can get quite slow. So, yeah, the ours, the Mozart system, which implements ours, yeah. it's an emulator. It's not even doing native code. Okay. Right. Okay. That, of course, gives you a performance hit. So that's a question of we don't have enough implementers. We worked, we, we spent all of our time inventing the concepts. Right. But of course, we need a native code compiler. And of course, what you really want is to extend mainstream languages like Scala or Java so that they can handle deterministic execution. Okay? I, see, I, see, I, see. I mean, Oz, in a sense, is an exploratory system. So okay. it was not intended to be the highest performance. It's not native code. Okay, It's emulator. Right. So, but the concurrency is still very well implemented in, in Mozart. Huh? Yeah, yeah, the threads yeah. are extremely lightweight. So in that sense, it's kind of like Erlang. So Java threads are very heavy, and that's wrong. Okay, you want concurrency to be easy, but people don't want concurrency to be easy because they consider it hard. Okay, even my colleagues in the department, concurrency is hard, but it's not if it's if you look at the only the functional form of it. Right. I teach it in my second year course, and students are writing programs with hundreds of threads in the second year, and they're running correctly. Okay. Yeah. Because they're deterministic. Yeah. Concurrency mm. for dummies. I like that expression. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you've got a you've also got another one called Paradigms for Dummies. And that's that's quite a yeah, famous that's a, one. That's an article, Programming Paradigms for Dummies. Right, right. So so that's another point is that multi-paradigm is normal. Huh? I mean, you have all these schools, object-oriented, uh, logic programming, functional programming. Yeah. And each one of them, so the functional programming guys are very religious, okay? Oh, those guys are religious. So you tell them, but monads is not as expressive as true mutable state. And the reason is the state is not named. So in a, in a language like Java, you have a pointer, which is an address, which actually is a name for a stateful box. Well, monads don't give you that. Oh, and then the guy is looking at me, some functional guy says, yeah, yeah, but... And his answer to that was, but just look at monads and you'll see they're very good. Sorry, you're not even answering my question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know what monads are, but monads is not named state. Okay, so the functional guys have their view. They're very religious. But in fact, in real world, you need all of them. So functional is very good for a part of your program, but it's not good for the part that interacts with the real world. Right. There you need concurrency. State is basically time. It's things that change over time. Functional programming is not good for handling things that change over time. Databases, you know, where you're updating things, but the real world is based on time. Huh? Things change all the time. Yeah. Functional programming is not good for that, but it's good for transformations like MapReduce. Right. Okay. So you need all the paradigms, you need them. So multi-paradigm is basically uh in some sense it's just common sense okay you yeah. need all of them and people are starting to realize that when I mean, you have lambda expressions in java now people want pure functions in java yeah. uh, Erlang already is doing things very nicely because it has pure functions inside the processes but the processes are multi-agent so it's a multi-layer system so this is very nice so Erlang actually did many things right huh? yeah and they still hold up very well today right. okay? So a, a couple of years ago, um, I went over to Champaign, uh, University of Champaign in Urbana. I think that's the one. And um, I met with a professor called Professor Grigori Rosso, Rosso uh, who he's the guy behind the K framework. Uh, do you know much about that? K framework? No, no, K, tell me. Okay. Um, I, I, th I think he uses a very high level stuff, uh, um, like a, almost like a pattern uh, matching. Uh, I'm going to butcher the explanation. Um, uh, it uses like a, almost like pattern matching to not not the pattern matching that that um, that, that the programming paradigm. I, I, I don't know. I suppose but basically pattern matching syntax to describe different languages. So Grigori, he he looks at these systems and he says, I don't care if it's functional or imperative or any of these different paradigms. You can use the same. Um, uh, uh, syntax to describe each of these languages. And you can actually go further to actually describe them almost. Name. So you get a, a correct by construction, essentially, uh, type 
type systems. <clears throat> well, it's, yeah, I don't even want to go further. I'm you just going to butcher the description. Okay, so I don't know Kane frameworks, but you have to realize that each of the paradigms is good for solving certain problems. Functional programming is good for certain things. Actor model is good for certain things. Um, uh, imperative style, like monitor is good for certain things. Transactions are good for certain things. So each paradigm has to be, you have to be able to write programs in a paradigm without being contaminated by others. So if he can do that, if he can make sure that I'm writing purely functional and I'm not by accident introducing mutable state, then that's good. You have the paradigms, you have to somehow make sure that they don't always contaminate each other. Uh -huh. Okay. I see. I see. Well, maybe I'll have a endeavor with Gregor Grigori Russell about this sort of thing later on down the line. You have to support them. Huh? You have to support multiple yeah. paradigms. But it's like my example I like is building a house. When you build a house, you need masonry, you need carpentry, you need yeah. electricity, plumbing. Those are all paradigms, okay? You're not going to build your house with pipes, but pipes are very good for <laughs> transporting water, okay? <laughs> so this is why you need multiple paradigms when you build a house. Right, multiple right, right. expertises. Right, right. right and the right, same right. for big programs. Yeah. But people are realizing it now. But in the time we originally did Oz, which was 1999, people didn't realize that. Okay, that's more than 20 years ago. Yeah. You see the history. So we had this history of, of Oz. Yeah, let's go into the history of that. Let's go into yeah. the history of Oz. I think, I think it's quite a, yeah. So the whole thing started in the early 90s. It actually started in an EU project, EU funded project called the Claim. In those days, EU projects were able to do fundamental things. It's not so hard. It's not so easy today now in 2021. But in those days, you, we could do that. So this project was working on concurrent constraints. So that's a formal model, okay? It's a formal process calculus. So this is on the level of pi calculus, lambda calculus, concurrent constraint model, which is a very powerful model. So this is like the semantic underpinning. And the guy who did it is, um, he's from India, Vijay Saraswat, actually. Uh -huh. He won the ACM Distinguished Dissertation Award for that. That was his thesis. And then we built systems. So there was this AKL system. There was the original Oz system in Germany. There was a system called LIFE, built by a guy named Hassan Aid Kassi at Digital Equipment Paris Research Lab. In those days, there existed a company called DEC, okay, which I worked at. They had a research lab in Paris. Oh, right. Uh, okay. But... Uh, but eventually they, unfortunately, they missed the personal computer revolution. They were making mini computers. But in those days, we did some really nice stuff in their Paris Research Lab. So all of this came together in the early 90s. Uh, so that, um, so the, the Oz system was built at the DFKI. This is the German Research Center for AI. This is a very big lab. It has two sites in Saarbrücken and Kaiserslautern doing big AI systems. So they, they needed a, a software, a platform to build these systems. So Gerd Smolka was a system building guy, but also theoretician working there. So they were gonna build the system for them, build the system in which the other research groups would build their big AI systems, okay? So this was very ambitious thing in those days, huh? Yeah. And so Acclaim was funding that from 92 to 95. And then, so the Swedish guys were in their digital, was in there, um, uh, the German guys were in there, and then a bunch of theory people were in there, uh, Ugo Montanari and other, all kinds of weird people. It was a mix, a real mixed bag of people in that project, okay? Yeah. So then we started working on building it, and at some point, the Swedish guys did a system called AKL. Uh -huh. And this was a system that actually solved a problem that was posed in the Japanese fifth generation project. You remember that? Maybe you don't. No, I don't. That was a thing that happened in the 1980s that scared everybody in the US and Europe because Japan was going to leapfrog into oh, yes, 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 yes. AI. Uh, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. And they put millions, billions, <laughs> hundreds of billions of yen into that. So, so, so that means the US and European funding agencies were scared shitless as you could say and yeah, they no, were raining yeah. funding on us to japan to scared the world japan scared the world but in those days so that japanese project failed miserably okay they Why? never well because they were 
way too conservative. They were organizing it in the Japanese way where you have uh, little groups where you have one guru uh, uh-huh. sensei and everyone is very much obedient. So they were very conservative, that project. And they were, they were not very original, except for a few people. Okay, There was a few smart people in there, uh, Kazuniri Ueda, Takashi Chikiyama. There was a few good people, but most of them were just committee style researchers. And so it failed, even though they built huge amount of hardware and everything, right. but that hardware never really was very advanced, okay? They failed. So, but one of the big things was combining concurrent logic programming and constraint logic programming. So logic programming was a big thing in those days, mm. based on prolog. Yeah. Logic, first order logic, so powerful, programming, so people were working on that. So you had constraint programming, which can do var large, which actually exists today and was hugely successful. Huh? It's today working very well and many people are using it. Huh? It's doing large combinatoric problem solving based on constraints, which is just logical relations. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you have concurrent logic programming, which they made operating systems out of that. It was a concurrent version, but those were two separate directions, concurrent and constraint. So they were separate. So AKL was this done in Sweden, and it was the first language that actually merged those two directions. So it was able to do constraints in a concurrent setting. Mm. So it was a huge progress. Okay, so it's actually a major thing. It's explained in our Hoppel paper. But then the people in Germany, uh, Gerd Smolke's group, they went even farther. They said, "Look, forget prologue, okay? Because AKL was still looking kind of like prologue. Forget prologue." We start from scratch. We take the good ideas from AKL and from other things like functional programming, and we make our our system for the DFKI. So they made it higher order, which AKL was not. And they took all the good ideas from AKL. And then they made the system called OS, the first system. And so then the Swedish guys did something very smart. So they did not, the Swedish guys who were led by Seferidi, they were not, they did not have this not invented here syndrome. They were going, okay, so these German guys are taking our stuff and from scratch, making this really nice system and clean and everything. Yeah. Let's join them, said the Swedish guys. Very (laughs) Swedish, okay? They were not like Americans. Let's make a competing system. No, they were saying, let's join them and we will have critical mass. So the Swedish and the German groups, boom, merged together. And that was just about the time when digital crashed and burned. So I was at digital. So you were left stranded. Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah, I was stranded. So I called up just like that, Gerd Smolka, and said, you guys are doing really interesting stuff. Can I work with you? (laughs) And Gerd was saying, oh. So his reaction was, in his German accent, oh, I'm very pleased. And so on. He was saying, I'm very pleased. Let's see. Yes, you can come as a postdoc. Okay. So, yes, yes. He has this way of, very German way of speaking. You know, I'm very pleased, he said. And that was his expression. So then I started working. I went to, we moved to Zabrücken in Germany. So very German Zabrücken. Huh? Oh, it's German, German. Oh, terrible. But, but I mean, people are nice. What can yeah. I say? So then say Faridi, who was, he's Egyptian, but he works in Sweden, Swedish yeah. Institute of Science. So he made a very nice lab. So he's a very original thinker. Some point he did a sabbatical in Zabrücken. And then I started working with Safe. So that's where my connection with SAFE. So we've been working together for the last 25 years, okay? So he's a good friend. He's really very nice. He's very nice, but extremely incisive. He can see right away. So it's great working with him, okay? So we worked on distribution in Oz and everybody else was working on this system called Mozart. And then we had the first Mozart release. So there was some pre-releases, but the first Mozart release, 1999, Mozart 1.0. So this was a whole group, Swedes and and Germans, all working on this big system. So this was a really nice system, okay? So released in 1999. So actually it was pretty popular, 10,000 downloads in one and a half years, okay? So we kept working on that. And the best Mozart system was 1.4.0. This was 2008. So we worked on it for a whole decade after that. Okay, but it was way off the radar of most people. So the fact that we were able to do distributed programming in a really much simpler way 
than in C or C++ was totally unrecognized by anybody in the distributed computing community. We were totally off their radar, even though we were doing really nice distributed system, okay? We were in some sense too advanced. That was our, our, um, our problem, okay? So Mozart 140 is the most advanced one. And then we made a big mistake. Uh, most of the PhD students, they graduate, they leave. Uh-huh. You didn't keep didn't, them in? It was very hard because they all want to do. So all so our key developers us. were uh-huh. leaving. Mm-hmm. 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 And, and we wanted to, and it was open source, Mozart. But we, we should have somehow made it into a real open source community. Yeah. But we managed to mess it up. Okay, so we didn't. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the decline of Mozart since those I days. see, I see. Okay. So I managed, so I was in Belgium then. I tried to keep it alive. I managed to get enough people to do a 64-bit version called Mozart right. 2, yeah. which is the one I use for my teaching. I'm still using it for teaching today. Yeah. And from my view, it's still the best for students, okay? Yeah. But it doesn't have all the great functionality of Mozart 140. That was like the... Yeah. crowning thing. So I'm actually doing something now. So Mozart 140 is 32-bit system. And many operating systems today do no longer support 32-bit systems. So I am I hire some students to package a Docker image so that anybody could run Mozart 140. Mm. So with luck, we'd be releasing it in a few days. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so that anyone can try because there's amazing function. 140 has amazing functionality that even today's systems do not have. Okay. It's an amazing system, actually, even though it's from 2008. So people should try it, I think, and see what you can do with that. And maybe they will be unsatisfied with the systems they're using. Okay. <laughs> when they see what Mozart 140 can do. Okay, so that gives you kind of the history. So I'm still using it for teaching today uh, yeah. in my second and third year courses. In my view, it's the best system to teach programming because it has all the paradigms together in a nice way. Uh, using only Python or only Java, it's way too limiting. Right. And students, and, they deserve better. Yeah, and, and just too much too much wetware because then, then each of these new languages that you pick up, you know, the exactly. bugs come along with it. and Each new language. And, then... and uh, yeah, so it, you could ha- you can have uh, Prolog or Java or Erlang or whatever, but you can't get them really to talk to each other. Yeah. So trying to teach a, a course where you have three or four languages in Haskell uh, together, that doesn't work. It's way too heavy. Yeah. You yeah. have to install the systems and they all have their quirks and blah. So Mozart, it's one system that does all the paradigms yeah. in a nice, clean way. So it's clean. So for education, that's good. It's not as efficient as as a C or C++, but that's not the point. I mean, the point is that the students have their way, we, they learn how to program, huh? Right, 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 right. So even now in 2021, for me, it's the best. And again, we tried presenting that at SIGC, the Special Interest Group on Computer Science Education. But again, in, in the early 2000s, when the book came out, we tried to present that to the education community but it never really caught on. It was way off their radar, okay? We were, unfortunately, we were not doing Scheme. We were not doing Smalltalk or Squeak. We were not doing Python. We were, each each little community had their thing. You have to teach using Scheme or Python. We were yeah. off the radar of all these people. So actually, but we did get a few universities using us, huh? So I think there was around, it's hard to keep track, but there were at least tw- like 20 universities who officially used uh, so my book and the us? Uh, well, I mean, I was in Malaysia well, that's once. Too bad. I was in, in I was in Malaysia once, and I was busy talking to like a group of, of people. And, Singapore and, used it. Oh, okay, no, but I was in Malaysia, and uh, in I was Malaysia. Speak, and and uh, I was speaking to some some a group of people, and uh, I just gave an example of of, uh, and I wrote some us code on the on the board, and then after yeah. the talk, the guy came up to me. He says, "Wasn't that Mozart Oz?" Oh, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> yes. And in fact, yeah. So actually, the National University of Singapore uh-huh. was, all, was one of the universities using oh, it. Okay. And I know one of the people there is Martin Hens. He is a professor there since many years, but he was one of the original Mozart designers. Ah, okay. So he knows that very well. Okay. He knows all that very well. <laughs> Singapore, it's not that far away from Hong Kong, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sort of. So you did a you did a project called Lightcone. 
um, ah, with a K. That's a light cone. Yes. And, Internet uh, of Things, edge computing. I'm kind of interested in, in, in hearing the discoveries that, you, that you've, you've come across with this. Um, yes. Okay. So the point is that, uh, so we moved from, so I moved from programming language into distribution colored by my language experience. Okay. Right. So we had some good ideas on how to do distribution. So this all starts from a guy named Mark Shapiro. I don't know if you know I am. him. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Mark uh, Shapiro. Uh, CRDT guy. Yes, yes. So he's famous for that. But he, so he's a, he's a well-known distributed systems mm -hmm. researcher. But he, with a few other colleagues, uh, uh, Nuno Pragusa, Carlos Baquero, Joao Laitao, they invented a concept called CRDT, which is a, basically a distributed data structure that so it's replicated yeah and when you update it you maintain consistency but you don't need consensus incredible so you maintain consistency so normally when you have replicated data structure you do update the usual technique replicated state machine uses consensus algorithm and of course for many reasons i really abhor i detest consensus and i can tell you why later but i'd like CRT, to hear does is much in some sense much more efficient. It maintains the consistency using notions of eventual consistency, what I call convergent consistency. So, so basically, the, all the updates propagate to all of the nodes, and as soon as they get there, they are incorporated at each node, and when that happens, automatically they're all consistent. That's it. They don't have to even agree on anything. So this is a mathematical, so it's basically, it's based on a mathematical structure called a joint semilattice. And there's lots of theory. So Mark Shapiro is the main guy. So his, his life work is consistency in distributed system, which is a big problem, okay? How do you maintain consistency? And he went through many, many things before coming up with the CRDT idea. But CRDT is actually like functional programming. It's very close. It's actually a form of functional programming. It's monotonic. Yeah. So functional programming is monotonic in the, some mathematical sense. But so are CRDT. So CRDT is an example of the bridge that I'm trying to build between programming and distributed systems. Okay. And so CRDTs, they were invented around 2011, okay, by Mark Shapiro and a few other people. And they, so of course, in the beginning, it was considered a very weird thing. But now it's actually used in, by many companies. Yeah. And so there's this thing called the React database, which maybe you know. Uh, Christopher Michael company, John, yeah. Basho. Yeah, 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 yeah. So unfortunately, Basho no longer exists. Yeah. So, so we had an EU project called SyncFree. So Mark Shapiro was organizing it, 2013 to 16. And so I managed to run into Mark in a conference and we started chatting and I said, oh, darn, this guy has good ideas. I want to work with this guy, okay? So, so I was one of the partners when they made the SyncFree project, uh -huh. and it was based on CRDTs. Synchronization-free. Basically, how do you do distributed computing without consensus? So, sorry, Leslie Lamport. I mean, you are a very smart guy, and, and Paxos is a very brilliant algorithm, but consensus is actually Paxos and Raft and any kind of consensus algorithm is the totally wrong way of building distributed system, okay? So I know that, and the reason is, well, one of the reasons is it's non-deterministic. Remember I told you that determinism is so nice? Well, consensus, Paxos is not deterministic, okay? Just blows it's it out the water. It's, yeah. yeah, it's completely non-deterministic. So each node proposes a value, they run the algorithm, and one of the values is chosen and they all agree, okay? That's Paxos. It's very complex, but it handles failures and everything. And then there's Raft, which Raft. does it in a cleaner way many years later. But Paxos was actually theoretically a major advance, okay? They all agree. But the problem is all of the nodes, they work to make a proposal. Most of that work is wasted because only one proposal is chosen. The others are thrown away. So it's, an, it's a brute force approach. You force all the nodes to agree. So that's, that, that's wrong. For me, that's fundamentally philosophically wrong. That's bad. Technology where you force, you use brute force is technology of the caveman, okay? It's caveman technology. 
Okay, so 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 while while I agree, uh, but uh, I want to throw a few spanners in Absolutely. this in this thing. I want to hear a few exceptions and your take on certain things. What yeah. happens if you have a consensus algorithm that is in a hostile environment whereby actors can manipulate the the data? Such that uh, you, so, you have a hostile environment and you need yeah. agreement in a hostile environment. Yeah. Okay. So hostile environments. Okay. So so this is the the um, the notion of hostile is is um, okay. So this is this is actually an orthogonal an orthogonal thing. So we did do some thinking about that, and the notion the the notion is that um, the problem with hostile environments is it's like non-determinism you want to avoid them as much as possible okay sometimes you can't avoid them sometimes you need byzantine uh when you do blockchain of course you have many hostile people but but uh we're trying to work together with different uh motives and so on but in general you want to avoid as much as possible so sometimes like so in my view something like um byzantine consensus is it's like non-determinism. You cannot always avoid it, but you can reduce it a lot, okay? So in my view, so Byzantine algorithms, actually, you almost never need them. So it's like in the real world, okay? Uh, in the real world, when I travel to a country, I, they check my passport at the border, and once I get in, they don't check it every time I open my mouth, okay, or buy something. I'm in this trusted environment. Well, so I, uh, otherwise, they would be checking it every single time there would be a policeman. Whenever I open my mouth or go to a store, that's Byzantine. Okay, if I'm, but that's like military. That's like a war. If you have yeah. soldiers, yeah. En enemy soldiers, they're always hostile and they have to force the other guy to do what they want them to do. Okay, right. so in my view, Byzantine algorithms is if you're in a wartime, a war setting. So in real world, of course, you cannot always avoid wars, but you want to minimize them, okay? Okay. So in my view, uh, yes, in that case, you do need hardcore consensus in the Byzantine case, absolutely. And even a uh, stronger version of Paxos, so the Byzantine consensus, and it's very hardcore, it's very inefficient, uh, Byzantine algorithms. But the point is, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, do I really need to do this algorithm or can I make another design choice that avoids completely this algorithm? Okay. No. Okay. okay. So, so like, for example, in this, in the scenario of, of the, the original cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, like mm -hmm. there's some interesting things have arisen from that. It, I, it is brute force in the sense that you force. have to, you have to get these uh, hashes uh, with a certain number of zeros, exactly. but, but it's simple. It's very, very simple, um, mm -hmm. a Nakamoto consensus. But as a result, you know, with the block height, actually that, con that translates into the concept of time. So now you've got an algorithm which allows uh, uh, smaller states to mm -hmm. use a reserve, international reserve currency, which is on the same footing as uh, big states. So like big states, right. like the United States, can't just sort of like, you know, right. print, print up the international reserve currency of the world um, and, and uh, basically make the smaller states their slaves. And also, uh, you also get the concept of time. So basically, now you can build these uh, de uh, deterministic systems, uh, which uses the right. input. In of fact, it's time. a structure, it's an edifice. You have one very strong That's consensus right. algorithm, anonymous cryptographic consensus. Right. One, only one worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else is built Plugs on the into strength it. of this foundation. Right. So this foundation is incredibly strong. Right. And the proof is that it has lasted so many years and no one has broken it. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's a very strong foundation. So it's yeah. based on cryptographic security and right. things like proof of work that, that are very strong. Right. I mean, right. they can be inefficient. People are trying to find efficient, but that's an, that's an orthogonal issue. Right. The point is they're very strong. And you can build on top of that. It's like a nation state. Huh? So the EU or the United States or China, whatever, they have a strong organization. Right. And you can build on that. You can build an economy on that. Yeah. And you can assume that the United States will defend the dollar. And the dollar exists because the United States exists. And it's strong. So Bitcoin is the same. 
So, but the point is, you only need one. Strong yeah. Foundation. Yeah. 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 So, a million of them. So this okay. this comes to your your argument of like you know like uh you know it, it's yeah, you cannot avoid. And, I'm I'm not yeah. saying you avoid consensus always. Okay. There are a few cases where it is essential right. that you need to, voting is another thing. Oh yes. So voting. You have to, at some point, count everybody's vote once. So you need a global agreement that this is the count, and it has to be secure. But that, that is only actually done at one point, the final decision okay, of the vote. Whereas most of the voting software can be deterministic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, this, so Bitcoin is, a, is an example of this. So most of the Bitcoin software, the local software, I mean, there's lots of stuff around it built oh, on top of it. Insane NFTs, amounts, yeah. Uh, smart contracts. Most of that stuff is deterministic, okay? Yeah. Because it's built on this one strong foundation. So that's the point. You need a single strong foundation, but only one, not 10 million, okay? <laughs> so that's an example of, but still probably most of the software around is still way too non-deterministic and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but uh, but you only really only need one point of non-determinism, which is the, the the anonymous consensus itself. That's really which is a large distributed system. But the the actual point of decision is actually much smaller than the 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 overall system. If you look at it carefully, yeah. So it's actually only a fairly small but very strong point that you right, need. Right. So the strength comes from the cryptographic, the strength of the cryptographic algorithms. If you could break those, Bitcoin would collapse. Fall apart. Right, nobody has seen how to break them. They seem to be very strong. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so, so, yeah. It's, so it's so like it's with an example. Every, yeah, with yeah. every step of time, it's almost like we can see the the value in the network shifting from person to person. Yeah. So it's like so, and those are strong building blocks that you can actually build these economic systems on you top. Build, of, it's yeah. strong enough. That you yeah. can actually you could build an economic system on right. top, even though I mean, in my view, they still haven't found the real use for Bitcoin. I mean, there is a real use. You could replace the legal system by a cryptocurrency-based smart contract system. Okay, and the legal system where you need notary public, you need uh, law courts for deciding. You have contracts where you have multiple parties deciding, and in case one of them doesn't do something, then something is done, etc. There's penalties, whatever. You need some technique of enforcing that. And the cryptocurrency infrastructure could be such a, an enforcement. Right now, it's not. Each country has its own legal enforcement system, which is uh -huh. separate. But I mean, conceptually, it could be that. So in my view, Bitcoin is still looking for the, the real thing. I mean, a currency, it's a currency, but much more than that, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's still looking for the real application and people sense the value that it brings. But right now uh, it would have to replace things that already exist like currencies, national currencies, legal systems, and nations are reluctant to give up sovereignty. It's funny, huh? Yeah, so far so only, one, only one has, which is El Salvador. El Salvador, yeah, <laughs> but, but only partly, okay? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And they think maybe there's an advantage for them. But basically, and the EU, we see that very clearly, uh, sovereignty is, is not usually given up freely. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> so, so Bitcoin, uh, all the nations would have to see a clear advantage over the current right. system. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I, we can go That's into that a little crypto. further, but I, mean, we, I suppose I can entertain just this little line and then we can change the subject, which is that actually I think Bitcoin is, is focusing on becoming like a settlement layer. So just keep it dead simple, keep that core consensus mm -hmm. dead simple. And then from there, you can have like layer two. You can twos, build like many things on top of that. Transactional system. Many, and, many things. In fact, you can be very creative. Huh? Yeah. But then the legal systems and all of that stuff would be built on top of the transaction. Built system. on top of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it all is based on the strength of that foundation. Of the so we hope yeah. that it's strong. Huh? <laughs> well, we hope that nobody can crack it in the next 10 years. Okay. So far, it's holding up. It's holding up. Huh? But who yeah. knows? Yeah, you yeah. will have to have very large. I mean, for a thing like RSA, you c it's, it holds up if you have pretty big key size, right. like 1,000 bit, 2,000 bit. It's totally safe as far as we know. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. As far as we know. Well, I think you can change the the, the hashing algorithm in Bitcoin uh, as, as you progress. But, but whatever algorithm it's there, it has to be a strong algorithm. It'll be an arms race. Yeah. Well, that's what cryptography Right now, the, is. it seems to be very strong and holding yeah. up well. Yeah. Uh, and there may be fundamental reasons. Maybe some mathematician will prove the strength and then we're good. Huh? All right. Now, right now, now, there's no proof of that yet, but uh, yeah, yeah. Peter, during we, we had a five minute um, uh, 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 meeting like a couple of days ago, just to sort of like uh, bash, bring our heads together. And you brought up something and I, I failed to take a note of it. You mentioned some sort of like way of aggregating information together from a number of different sources, which and makes it transparent and very easy. I think it was in an IoT setting. And then you said, do you know about that? And I said, no, I don't. And you Are said, you talking oh. about sensor fusion? Sensor Common filters? That's it. Could so, you please go so, into that? So yeah, so, so this is part of our work on Internet of Things, edge computing. Wow. Yeah. And it's very simple. The cloud is basically maturing. It's not growing very fast anymore, 5% per year. Whereas the edge is exploding, small edge devices. So everybody is seeing that. So the point is you want to do stuff computation at the edge. So in the room where I'm sitting and so it, you interact with the real world. So you basically have sensors interacting with the real world, yeah. like um, sonars or microphones or uh, accelerometers, gyroscopes, whatever, all kinds of interesting stuff, magnetometers. We have experience with all that. So each sensor sees a piece of reality but you want a single view. You want somehow to combine all this information to have a view of what's going on. I mean, the human brain does this very well. Huh? The ears, the eyes, uh, the smell, all of that is integrated by very smart neural nets inside the, your, your skull. Huh? So we don't know how to do that very well yet for um, computing systems, except there is a very interesting technique called Kalman filter. So the idea is that it basically predicts the behavior of any physical system. So you need a simple model. So it's, if it's a ball flying in the air or if it's a train or if it's whatever, a human walking in a room, uh, follows Newton's laws, very simple, okay? But then, so the, the common filter is predicting the human is walking in a certain direction. And then you measure where the human actually is. And so those are two pieces of information, the prediction and it's like probabilistic. And then this measurement, which is also probabilistic. So then the smartness is you actually intersect those two. So if you intersect the two, you get a much better. So you basically correct the prediction with what the measurement tells you. And, and, the, and it depends on physical model, but with a simple model using Newton's laws. So we actually have experience with that. You can combine things like accelerometer, sonar, gyroscope, magnetometer. Uh, that's what we combined already. Huh? And you can combine all those to get a very good picture of what's going on. And the common filter, it, it's pretty magical. It does all this in a very nice way, okay? All it needs is a simple physical model. And you can extend, you can, you, it can also interact with machine learning, for example. Huh? So it, it's at the same level of abstraction as machine learning. You cannot say that common filter will take machine learning as input or vice versa. They're basically at the same level. So machine learning lets you interpret things like images, whatever, whereas common filter lets you combine things. So what you could do is you could combine things and then send it to machine learning to interpret, or you could interpret the image and then send it to common. You see, so they're kind of at the same level. They're doing, they're solving two separate problems. So the machine learning, which is the, the magic that is highly mediatized these days, deep learning, woo, it's so magical. Everyone's trying to use it. Whereas calm filter is another kind of magic, okay? Which is less mediatized, but which is as interesting in fact. And it's widely used huh, in sensor networks, huh? but it's not as well known. So we built this very nice framework, an airline for doing sensor fusion, open source, uh, low cost, using the system called GRISP, which is done by a small company in Germany, Stritzinger. So the GRISP boards, they're like Raspberry Pi, only they're targeting IoT. So you can put sensors on them, which are called PMOD sensors. And, and we, get, we have all the software to do sensor fusion with a network of GRISP boards. 
And so this works really well. So this is the future in my view. Huh? All the computing is done on these little edge boards and not in the cloud. In my view, the cloud is now legacy, okay? This is a heresy also. Huh? So the problem with cloud is, first of all, it's far away, tens of milliseconds or whatever. Second of all, you have to send the, your data there and that connection can go down, okay? Also, you have to pay for Am Amazon, they cost money, yeah? AWS. Whereas if you do everything at the edge, uh, it's much cheaper and more reliable and lower latency. Of course, you'll say, well, you don't have all the compute power. Well, hardware is cheap and getting cheaper. You actually have a fairly good amount of compute power already at the edge. So you, could, you don't really need to go to the cloud. I mean, you can still use the cloud, for example, for aggregating. If I have many edge systems and they're all learning stuff, you can, you can do like aggregate learning at the, in the cloud and then send all the things. But it's a plus, okay? It's an extra thing. The basic stuff does not need, you do not need cloud. And in fact, the edge is outpacing the cloud by far. So of course, the companies like Google and Amazon, they're not going to advertise this point uh, because most of their profit comes from data centers, uh, Facebook, and so on. Whereas edge is out of their control. So they're building edge platforms, which are still very cloud centric. Okay. Whereas in the future, it will be the opposite. Most of the stuff will be going on the edge and you will only need the cloud in those few cases where you actually do need to aggregate, okay? Right. So in my view, the future is edge computing and most of the actual computation will be done outside of the cloud and you will only use cloud as a, 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 to give an extra. But for the basic functionality, you will not do it. And even Apple has realized that because now their voice recognition thing is running as all completely on your phone. It used to be always talking to the Siri of the cloud, but of course they noticed that that's not very nice. The performance is lower and doesn't always work, et cetera, it costs money. So the phones are very powerful. So most of that's, a lot of that software is now running directly on the phone, okay? And that's a trend that will keep going. Well, there was all that controversy about um, uh, um, uh, uh, Amal, uh, Apple um, processing images of, on their phone. And uh, then, you know, for but, like, for example, exactly. child porn See, and stuff like that. That's the point. So yeah. the phone should be completely controlled by the person who owns the phone. Right. And not by Apple. Okay. Of course, I want everything to be done where I can control it. Of course. I don't want you the government. It. Uh, so, so Apple will have to make systems. I mean, open source systems already do it, huh? but Apple will have to make systems where provably it is the owner of the system who controls it and not Apple. Okay. Otherwise people will be continually unhappy. So there's a pressure for that. Huh? Uh, I have my laptop here. I want to be in control of what happens in this laptop, not Apple. Okay. And in, in, in a big sense, I am. For most things, I actually am in control. Huh? So this is a trend that will keep going. And more and more people will have the compute power close to them, even woven into their shirts, huh? and they will control it. And, the, and they will only delegate control like to Apple explicitly when they want to delegate. Huh? So there's a strong trend for this. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, do you have any other sort of like uh, areas in technology that you'd like to go into or touch on? Technology, ah, yes. Well, technology. Well, I have a lot of, so what I've talked to you so far is all which is connected to my research. Right. But my research is like the core, but it, there's a lot of other stuff where I'm not <laughs> directly doing research, but which I have thought about. Huh? Uh, yeah. So um, the notion of brute force versus versus smart technology. So I say that uh, consensus, in my view, is an algorithm that will, whose use will be reduced in the future, only in the few cases where you actually need it, because it's a brute force algorithm, right. okay? And uh, my analogy is uh, using a consensus is like a society where all decisions are made by lawsuits. It's not very <sighs> practical, huh? Consensus is like a lawsuit. Everybody proposes and one of them wins and the others lose. 
Come on. It's, it's interesting. Really wait, was- it's interesting you mentioned this because uh, a couple of endeavors ago, I had a, I had a, a talk with a chap named Robin Hansen. Um, okay. And he went into this, uh, an example about, you know, like, it's not applicable, really. Okay, let's sidestep that. Continue. Might please. be, but you can come back to it. Okay. Yeah? Uh, so you say like, okay, um, a lawsuit. And Another example everybody- of a brute force is internal combustion engines. Uh-huh. So you have, you have gasoline, which has a lot of energy in it. Yeah. And I want to make a motor uh, cars run. So what do I do? I use the worst possible approach. I convert the energy in the gasoline to heat. And then I laboriously convert a small fraction of that heat to mechanical work. Heat is the worst low quality form of energy that exists. If you know thermodynamics, huh? okay? But that's how it works. And there's a limit in the efficiency. It's called the Carnot cycle. It depends on the difference in temperature between the highest and the lowest, but it's essentially very low. It's like what? 30%, 40% at the very, very best, okay? So come on, you take this high quality energy in your gasoline, you convert it to the lowest possible, and then you, laboriously convert a little bit of that to the mo- to the wheels of the motor. Come on, how brute force stupid can you get? In fact, huh? of course, in the 19th century, this was considered miraculous. But nowadays, we're actually doing much better. So electricity is also a high quality form of energy, electrical energy. And electric motors, they're actually much, much, much more efficient than internal combustion. They're more than 90% efficient, okay? So if you have like windmills converting wind to electrical energy being fed to electric cars, you're doing much better, okay? Your technology is much more, it's much smarter, it's much more in tune with physical law, in fact. Huh? Whereas Carnot cycles or consensus, woof, caveman technology, both, okay? <laughs> yeah, caveman. <laughs> huh? I know Leslie Lamport is a smart guy and he did many things and consensus is a necessary algorithm, is, and I'm not, disputing that but it's much overused right. same way that internal combustion you do need to generate heat sometimes okay but not as much as we're doing today <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's one bit uh, but there's also some other things i can talk about like um like physics oh one. let's go into that that sounds like fun okay so so i one of the things i like to do is go to first principles. So I'm not primarily a physicist. I'm a computer scientist, but I do have a a PhD in computer science and I have taken a lot of technical courses. So I can understand a lot of technical things. So what I like to do is go to the basic principles of a field and see whether they are reasonable. Uh, You can see that in programming also, a determinism, basic principle, functional programming, lambda calculus, uh, or Internet of Things, basic principle, you don't want latency, okay? You want uh, to do things directly or the Carnot cycle, the brute force. Uh, so so in, if you look at physics now, now I'm looking at the standard model of particle physics that's supported by billion dollar uh, particle accelerators and, and all kinds of and very smart people, okay? So what can I as a lowly computer scientist say with respect to that? actually quite a bit uh, and it's not only me huh? so this i'm not inventing this idea but i this is an idea that is very important now it's clear that in physics as it exists today in that nature we never observe actual infinities okay we never observe things that are actually infinite infinite energies or uh, infinite size things we only observe potential infinities things that are maybe growing but that don't have a limit, uh, but never an actual realized infinity. And physicists would agree with this. We don't observe this. So this is a problem for physical theory because for example, black holes, theoretically, they have a singularity in the center somewhere behind the event horizon, which is an actual realized infinity in theory. So physicists say things like, the theory is predicting its own downfall, okay? because it's predicting a thing which, which does not exist and has never been observed. So in my view, the problem is very fundamental. The problem is that physical theory itself is the mathematics. Peter, it's can I press pause? I need, I need a plug in. No actual infinities are not yeah. observed in nature. So ideally, 
Um, so in fact, the problem with physical theory is that it predicts actual infinities. So one way to solve this, which is not ad hoc, is to look at how physical theory is done. And actually, this was something I was been interested in for a while. Uh, how do you define real numbers, mathematical concept of real numbers? So mathematicians have spent a lot of time in the 19th century making formal definition of real numbers. So things like delicate cuts, their limits, basically, limits of rational numbers, right. Cauchy sequences. So a real number is an actualized infinity, actually. It's a limit of an infinite sequence. Uh, so it's an actualized infinity. So making a physical theory on real numbers, you have baked in actualized infinities in the basic theory of mathematics of it, okay? Now, this is okay in some sense because it's like um, an idealized approximation. A real number uh, is an idealized infinite precision entity, which is good but you should not take it too seriously, okay? You cannot assume that real numbers actually exist in nature. That would be going too far because that's an actualized infinity, okay? So in my view, and not just my view, there's actually an article, there's articles on this. So some physicists, they do realize this fundamental point. There's an article called Physics Without Determinism by Flavio del Santo, Nicolas Gissin. So this is where I, I first saw this idea, okay? Uh, uh, and so a physics based on real numbers is the wrong theoretical basis. So if you don't have real numbers, what do you do? Well, actually mathematicians have thought about this. There is a form of mathematics called intuitionism where uh, you can only uh, reason about constructible entities not about limits, actualized limits, not infinities. So Cantor would not like this, huh? his right. theory of infinities. But this is fine as an, as an idealization. So I'm not saying theories of infinities are wrong. The point is that nature does not actualize that, okay? Well, didn't it all go wrong with Cantor? No, on the contrary. Oh. Huh? There's this thing that Cantor created a paradise. Huh? Hilbert was saying, nobody's going to chase us out of this paradise, you know? No, no, uh, infinities are a mathematical idealization. They're mathematical entities. But uh, the question of whether they actually exist in the real world is another point, okay? Is another question. And the only way is to observe, to do experiments. Huh? So there are many mathematical concepts invented by mathematicians. Not all of them exist in the real world, clearly. Huh? Mm. Okay, it depends. Only some, some of them, somehow, the way the world is made. So the world is very mathematical. So that's already a very amazing thing. But still, it's not all mathematics, as far as we can tell. Huh? So we have never observed an actual infinity. So that means any theory which assumes actual infinities from the very beginning as a postulate will clearly be wrong. Okay, or an, it'll be an approximation, uh, the way Newton is an approximation to Einstein, it'll be an approximation, and it will sometimes break down. Okay? Right. So it breaks down in many cases. So uh, singularities is only one case, but there's another case where it breaks down, which is very interesting in quantum mechanics. So you know that mathematically a probability is also an actualized infinity. It is a limit of a frequency as the number of trials goes to infinity, okay? So mathematically a probability is also yeah. an actualized infinity. It's more than just a real number. It's also a limit of frequency, okay? So look at, uh, now, a quantum measurement. So, okay, so there's many ways to explain quantum measurement. I'm going to use one of the explanations, might be not the best, but it all boils down to doing a measurement and there's a probabilities of finding different states, quantum states. So people will sometimes talk about collapse of the wave function, whatever, but the point is that when you do a quantum measurement, you have multiple possibilities, each one which has a probability. And this is a theoretical point. Huh? You have the quantum wave function, and you can compute this probability. So these are real numbers, real mathematical probabilities. So the point is, this is wrong, okay? They are not, the real probabilities don't exist in the real world. It's only an approximation in our theory. So if this is the case, what does exist in the real world? I mean, it's very weird actually. Uh, you do a quantum measurement and a random choice is made. 
random in this mathematical sense of having certain probabilities of having certain values of which measurement, what the value is of the measurement. But if the actual probability does not exist, where is that information coming from? Okay, now we're getting into my personal speculation. So in my view, whenever you do, whenever you do this, there is information coming into the universe, which was not there before, because real world infinite precision does not exist in the real world. So whenever you do a measurement that brings in new information, uh, in the physics theory, it's very simple. Well, the information was already there because you have infinite precision or whatever. But in fact, the information was not already there. That means the information is coming into our universe from the outside, from somewhere else. Okay, so in my view, this is something that physics will have to come to grip with. Okay, and people, okay, physicists will, will attack me, attack this point in many ways. And I'm not the one who invented this idea. This is a physical idea that physicists, some physicists are working on. Huh? So, okay, people will say, yes, but all this information coming in, it still obeys statistical laws of random numbers. But my reaction to that is, Yes, maybe it does sometimes, but how are you sure that it always obeys this? So what, it, what the laws does it obey? You can't just assume it obeys random law. You have to measure, you have to make experiments. So maybe it's not always obeying mathematical laws of randomness. Who knows what laws it's obeying? Maybe most of the time it is, and sometimes it's not, okay? So in my view, this will be a big thing in physics of the 21st century. In my view, there will be somebody, a very smart guy, not me, will reformulate physics using intuitionistic ideas. All the weird paradoxes. Another weird paradox, renormalization. You know, renormalization is a trick, okay? It's a hack for getting rid of infinities. Well, what do you know? Getting rid of infinities, and the infinities are there because you have real numbers. So the, the bare charge of an electron is infinite, infinite. But of course, the electron will induce virtual positrons around it, and the difference between the two is, is finite. The difference between two infinite numbers, which are actual infinities. It's finite. Well, what do you know? <laughs> this sounds problematic to me. So, so renormalization is a hack that seems to work. That's not satisfactory, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it works. It gives you correct values in many cases, but it's not a satisfactory foundation because you basically do a hack to get rid of the infinity that you introduced in the first place by using real numbers, okay? Maybe if you have an intuitionistic uh, theory of an electron, you will not have this infinity in the first place, okay? And maybe you get some extra bonus out of this. So one of the big problems in physics is quantum gravity. There is no satisfactory theory of quantum gravity. And uh, so relativ relativity has been very strongly tested, okay? It's pretty close to what we know about reality, but somehow there can, there's no, it's like oil and water. So uh, quantum chromodynamics, QED, does not mix with uh, relativity. There's no quantum gravity theory. Maybe it's a fundamental problem. Maybe a more intuitionistic view would be better. So again, relativity, relativity is based on real numbers, okay? Mm. So, so this is a point. So this, and it also, it, it points to many things. It points to the fact that our knowledge on the physics is actually highly incomplete. Uh, this notion of collapse of the wave function, this choice there is actually information being created that does not, did not exist before. So I'm talking about information theory. Yeah? If I have probabilities of different events and one of them occurs, you can compute the amount of bits of information that has been added when the choice is made. So this, so information is always being pumped in to our universe. And you cannot say that this information was already there because of real numbers, because real numbers are actualized infinity. You're putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. You're, you're, you're saying, yeah, all the information was already there. But, but that's not a really a defensible point, point of view. Okay, So there is information coming into our universe from somewhere else. Where? I don't know. 
I'm not, I'm not God. Okay. So I don't know. I don't want to speculate too much, but, but this seems to be the case. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so what do you think of that, Stuart? <laughs> Definitely for somebody All else to tackle. based on very simple reasoning. Okay. I am not right. inventing pie in the sky things. I am talking about things that are reasonable and are substantiated by uh, and physicists would say that what I'm saying is correct, even if they say, well, no, you're speculating, but they cannot point to somewhere where I'm saying a falsehood. Huh? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is correct. Huh? Mm -hmm. And I think some people are actually working on this. There's a guy, so Stephen Wolfram seems to be making a version of physics that is more constructive. Okay, he has a thing called Wolfram Project, which I haven't looked at. Huh? But if he's going in this direction, this is a good direction to go in, I think. Huh? Yeah, I th there's a couple of podcasts. He's also written a couple of books. Um, yeah. I haven't actually read them. Um, yeah, Wolfram, he's a bit of a headstrong. Oh, he's, he's, a, he's an outlier, but he's an original thinker. Yeah, so, true. Which is great. That, that, I mean, uh, that's but, absolutely um, true. a constructive physics, which right. is not based on actual infinities, I think that's something that we need to do and we don't have it. Okay? Right, 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 right. Do you want well, to change gears a bit to uh, what? It, yeah, what else? What else? There's more things, but uh, uh, let's hear it. No, no, no. I was going to. I have gonna... many interesting theories that are at this level. Okay. I'd love to hear them. So, uh, another theory is. Um, so, my theory about uh, the UFO phenomena, or oh. my reflections on that. <laughs> right. Okay. So, 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 in my view, the universe is a complicated place, and uh, we cannot assume that our current knowledge is definitive and there's many unknown things. Clearly what I just said about physics is pointing in that direction, okay? And right. it's clear in the 20th century, there have been many sightings of unusual phenomena, uh, vehicles with sometimes with inhabitants and, and not all of those are hoaxes, okay? There has been many stuff, of course, it's been highly mediatized and exploited by different groups. People are saying, yeah, they, they abducted me and told me all kinds of weird stuff. So I forget, forget all that. Look at the serious reports, okay? There exists some serious reports by hard-nosed people who actually talk to witnesses. And something is, there are things that are beyond our current understanding. It's very clear, okay? So my, what is my view on that? First of all, we have to assume that the, the reports written by honest observers are are correct as far as the observer thinks. We have to assume that they are not all hoaxes clearly. And there are sometimes traces on radar and stuff, okay? Uh, also, we have to assume that the phenomenon is not a recent phenomenon. It has existed for centuries. And you know that people tend to think that our ancestors were stupid. They were not stupid, okay? There are talks about elemental beings. So for example, Paracelsus, who is a very smart physician from the 16th century, okay? If you read his stuff, he was the first guy who really uh, understood using medicine for treatment. So, um, so he, in, for example, says something like, the, everything is poisonous, it depends on the dosage. Right. So that is tough. a very deep insight. So, and there's many other things. So the guy is very smart and he's pretty hard nosed. So he, one of his books is on these elemental entities. So I don't think he actually observed it, but he was working with many people on the terrain. He traveled a lot. And so anything similar to UFOs, he would have heard it, okay? And of course he wants to make a theory of it. So this, these elemental entities correspond amazingly to what the, today's reports on the UFO inhabitants when you see them. Huh? So, so this kind of information is useful in the past, and, and it's not the only one. There are many uh, witness reports written in old documents, okay? So, and then there's other things. So first of all, um, a lot of these sightings, uh, it's hard to record them. I mean, uh, with, photo, with cameras and so on, and they're always somehow at the limit of our perception. So it seems from some of these sightings that they are, um, that these, uh, the, the, whoever is behind it is able to modify the perception, okay? That seems to be true. Sometimes perception is changed. Sometimes there are deception. 
And also we have to assume that there is a purpose there and that they are intelligent and that they understand human society, okay? We cannot assume they're, they're dumb, okay, clearly. So, so what is that purpose? So will they never land on the White House lawn, for example, uh, clearly. They're always at the limit of our perception. So why is that? Well, that must be on purpose. There must be a reason for that, okay? And it's been going on for centuries. So clearly it's influencing human society. And clearly they don't want to be seen as a, as a threat. They want to be always at the limit of our perception. So we're even questioning their existence, okay? So they clearly want to be the, at the limit, but still they must be consciously perceptible so that we know about them. And they have been influenced in society for centuries. So in my view, this is something important and it may have an important role to play. So I don't know, it's hard to speculate. Huh? Like um, um, uh, uh, whatever, um, Robin Hanson, who's talking about quiet and noisy civilizations. Yes. Yes. So that's a speculation uh, which can change at, when our understanding changes. So, but, but there is something there that has to be, we have to try to understand it. Okay, that's clear. Okay, there is a continuous influence on human society pushing us in a certain direction. And it's clear they must have a long-term goal. But what is it? And it's over centuries. So they don't care what happens over 10 years. It doesn't, but, uh, but uh, because it's uh, for centuries and it has influenced society. Yeah? It clearly influences a lot popular culture. It influences also uh, science, for example, uh, certain things that are possible or not possible, okay? Uh, and there's some very interesting um, sightings. One of the interesting ones is from 1897. There was a sequence of sightings over the United States of a very strange airship in the daytime and at the nighttime, very weird colored things like today, okay? and over the United States. And sometimes they talk to the inhabitants. So it's clear somehow that the, the thing you see is always a thing that is close to what your technology is at that point in time. It was like an airship. But at night, there was no airship. It was weird lights. So the people dismissed the weird lights because in the daytime, there was the airship sites. So according to the, the, um, the report that I read, this seems to be a use of, of a deception technique, like in war, where you have a diversion. Uh, you have this airship site, uh -huh. so people don't care if something really weird happens on the side, uh, it doesn't matter. Also, there was um, very weird things, like in San Francisco, there was a somebody who came into the patent office and said, I'm going to make a patent for a, an advanced airship. So this thing was a kind of advanced airship. But the guy never showed up after that, okay? There was never a report sent in. So this is all very strange, and, but it seems to show that um, there are purposeful deceptions going on here, okay? And we have to take them seriously. Saying that it's ridiculous <coughs> because there's some clowns hoaxing with it is not good. So many scientists, uh, and this is well-documented, reject this because they consider it ridiculous. That's not a sufficient reason to not study. So this is not, but there are a few scientists who have actually, do actually study this, okay? Right. And try to understand this. And it's very, but, but it's hard to, to make real progress, but I think it's important for us. So now our civilization has progressed. We are now able to observe the whole earth at a level of detail that we were never able to do before. So maybe we're getting at a level where we can start to understand this phenomenon and talk to these whatever organization doing it at its own level. Maybe it's important for us. Maybe this is important for humans, okay? So this is something that must be studied in my view, okay? So that's uh, my idea. So I've been reading many of the, the serious reports, separating wheat from chaff. There's, there are many very serious reports huh? and in many all over the world, huh? And witness reports from that that you cannot doubt that the that the the, the the witness is honest, even though he's completely perplexed. He says what he thinks he saw, okay? And multiple witnesses. And so there's a lot of, and there's many hundreds, hundreds of these reports, thousands, and serious, okay? So you cannot 
reject all of that just because there's a few, of course it's mediatized and the US Army or whatever is, is I mean, there was this Project Blue Book whose purpose was to debunk it. But one right. of the organizers who was a guy named Edward Ruppelt was, he changed his opinion of it because he found too many inexplicable things. Uh -huh. So he thought it was all bogus. But at some point, there was too many things that were not explicable. And then there was this thing called the Condon Report, which was funded unique, uniquely to debunk it. But even they, in their thick report, 1,000 pages, they're, they're 20% of the sightings, they offer no explanation. But still, it's not worth studying. That's very weird, huh? 20% of the sightings are unexplained. You cannot explain them using even stretching things like, it's a sighting of Venus, or it's a meteor, or it's a balloon, or whatever. These things do things that Venus or balloons or meteors cannot do, okay? Uh, but even though they had that 20%, they still consider this uh, as not worth studying. That does not seem very scientific, in my view, okay? So, so this is an important thing. Do you have uh, any hypothesis in, in, into the physics of these, uh, these devices and like how, some, how, how they would move and that. whatnot? Actually, there's quite a bit of work on that. There is a really interesting book by a guy named Paul Hill, who was a scientist working at NASA. Uh -huh. So he did basically the following. He took the reports at face value, the credible reports, and he tried to imagine what kind of physics would be needed to show the behavior of this. And he has a very interesting model. So basically, you can explain the, the behavior. So the, these things behave amazingly. So they can accelerate at 100 G. They can turn on a dime, okay? At 100, they can stop instantly at 100 G and go in the opposite direction and up and down. So how do you explain that? And there's no sonic boobs, okay, with any of this. And there's weird colors and, and electromagnetic color effects and electromagnetic effects. So in fact, there is a, a plausible theory if you have a focused beam of gravitons, okay? Uh -huh. Gravitons, we have never detected them, okay? But physics says they must exist. They mediate the gravitational field. An anti-graviton. So basically, if you focus the beam from the, 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 the vessel to the Earth. So Newton's law still hold, of course, but this is not magic, okay? So Newton's third law, to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So a UFO that moves, that accelerates at 100 G, it has to be pushing against something. But what is it pushing against? Well, according to this theory, it's pushing against the Earth, which is reasonable. The Earth is huge, okay? So it has a focused beam of anti-gravitons because it's a repulsive effect, and it's focused downwards. And so this makes an enormous repulsive effect. And because it's a field, the, the atmosphere just around the, the UFO is also affected, so there's no sonic boom. So the reason why you have a sonic boom is that the, the air molecules are, 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 do not know that you are coming, okay? <laughs> you hit them. So there's no sonic booms. It's very quiet. So in this model, there would be no sonic booms, okay? And it, you can also use it to travel uh, in the solar system. The point is, the whole point is how narrow can you focus the beam? So if you get far away from the Earth, the Earth becomes very small. Uh, I mean, it looks very small. So if you want to push against the Earth, you need a very narrowly focused beam, okay? So apparently, if they exist, they have this technology that allows them to focus graviton beams or anti-graviton beams. I mean, in the solar system, you would also, you would pushing against the sun would be, of course, more if you go very far. But once so, you get far away, the sun yeah. would be apparent, would have a very small apparent diameter so you need to really be able to focus this beam, okay? So if you were to travel between solar systems, then you would sort of like, you, you would start off by emitting a beam against the sun, which would uh, exactly. propel you away. Propel and then you. you might have another beam, which would sort of like uh, yeah. pull then, you towards once Mars. once you're too far away from the sun, then you're focusing, you would not be able to accelerate more, but you would be going very fast. Huh? Because right. you can focus at 100 or 1,000 Gs. This has been observed, okay? Very fast. And then when you... Uh, a few weeks later, you would get close to Alpha Centauri or wherever. You start a couple of light years, but because you're accelerating so fast, it would be relativistic speed very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then, and you would not have any inertial effects because you are part of the field, okay? You would not right. feel any ill effects from this. You would not feel 100G because it's not pushing against you. You are part of the 
the gravity, okay, you are you are being accelerated as the rest, okay? Right. So, but once you get close to Alpha Centauri, you would slow down with the same by focusing against the sun of Alpha Centauri. Well, what happens if there's a building or something? What what would happen to the building? Would it just get torn <laughs> apart? Ah, well, <laughs> yes. And in fact, that is actually seen. Uh, these things, um, whenever there is a physical trace, sometimes there is, they are perceived as being extremely heavy. So they will actually compress the earth oh. under them. But of course, the field is not, in, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's spread over a certain volume, okay? It would not, but still, um, you, this is the kind of effect you would expect, okay? Mm -hmm. You have a very strong push at 100 Gs, you would compress the earth very strongly, okay? So you actually see that, not always, but there are sightings where there are physical, there are effects on the earth. Okay? right, right, right. Oh, yeah. So this is the most plausible. So this is a, this book by Paul Hill, it's actually very, very hard nosed. He's not. He's not speculating on anything that is not substantiated by reliable witness reports. Okay. And there's another book by uh, a serious observer called M. A. Michel from the 50s. So he does not have this knowledge of gravitons, but he has. There's also a physical uh, a theory in there which is consistent with Hill's, but but not as well um, developed. So Paul Hill's speculation is the most reasonable I've seen, okay? So how can we focus anti-gravity on beams? We have no idea, okay, how to do that, how to do that in a, in a high density. We have no idea, but maybe if someday we have quantum gravity, maybe we'll figure out how to do it. Aha, but, uh, so now it comes down to the mathematics, change the mathematics to figure yeah, out quantum gravity, maybe. and we can get these vessels, is it, that right? It seems that um, this, this, this explains, and it explains many things. It explains why they, they tilt. So they have these tilts. Uh, so because if you're pushing against the earth, if you want to go this way, you have to tilt that way. So you have to push, you're always pushing against the earth. Or pulling. So if you're going like this, you would have to tilt like this, okay? okay because you're pushing back. And then if you want to slow down, you can slow down at 100 G, you tilt in the other direction and you would instantly or very quickly in a fraction of a second, you would stop and change direction because of the very large accelerations, okay? So in the witness reports, the, the, they talk about these vessels appearing and disappearing instantaneously. But I mean, it could be in a small fraction of a second, okay? So this is all consistent with that. And, uh, and with other things too, like the, um, the, the colors and so on. So there's Doppler effects, but Paul, or, Paul Hill ex explains that in his book. How would, you get so the, me, how would you get the colors though from a Doppler effect? How, how does that happen? There is some electromagnetic effect. I don't know, you, I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't understand the real, the details. I would have to read Paul Hill's book again. Okay. But um, there is some electromagnetic effect from these gravitons. Uh, it's not only, it, I don't know. I would have to read Paul Hill's book, but uh, but uh, but there is some uh, explanation of that too. Okay. But it, it does explain all the, the tilting and the wobbling also. There's these things wobble sometimes, and the reason is how when they when they go down, you want to there's certain there's certain physics of how you want to land on the ground and so on. So so this would explain the wobbling effects that you sometimes see in these sightings. Okay. Mm. So, so this is, for me, it's so far the most uh, plausible of all the speculation. It's all speculation, huh? For sure. No. But the assumption is good. And uh, you have to assume that the witness reports are written by honest observers. Uh, of course, you make a, a selection first. Huh? You don't accept all of them. So we're even maybe being too conservative here huh? <laughs> in some sense. Okay. So, so uh, from my view, this is important. So I think human society has come to a certain point where now we have a global civilization where before we did not. And now we have technology that is touching on more fundamental things like quantum theory, which we never had before, okay? Right. Even electrodynamics. So at some point we will be able to understand this. Maybe there's a reason, maybe we are supposed to contact them. I don't know, now it's all speculation. Eh? Maybe they are helping us to mature, maybe we are, but it seems they are a form of quiet alien in oh. Robin Henson, but they are 
affecting us. So at some point, they are interacting with us, but in a very mild way. There's no forcing going on here. Huh? So yeah. anything we do, so they're not telling us physics. We have to invent it by ourselves. I think that's, that's uh, important. We have to slay our own demons. You know, our society has a lot of problems. Huh? And there's a lot of irrationality. There's wars. We're not really very stable yet. That's right? clear. Huh? <laughs> We've seen so, that from so the, the COVID UFO situation. So the people are not solving that for us. They are not deus ex machina. And I think that's on purpose. We, in order to be worthy in some sense, so now it's I'm speculating, huh? in order to be worthy, we have to slay our demons ourselves. They can show us that there's something, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Looking at them, we can see there's something there. And maybe that can give us hope or whatever, but we have to slay our demons ourselves. They will not solve it. They will not land on the White House lawn and tell us how to organize society, okay? They will not. And I think that's on purpose, okay? So in the, in the, in the tune of uh, slaying our own demons, do you, yes. you, you spent a lot of time, I think it was at Princeton. Um, so I think oh. you've got a, was but it at not? Berkeley, yes. At Berkeley, sorry. At Berkeley, yes. Yeah, 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 Berkeley, Berkeley. Um, you've area. got a bit of a, a background about the Americans and, and, and what's... I grew up in America half my life. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, so I'm Belgian, but my father uh, got his PhD in biochemistry in the University of Pittsburgh. So starting at the age of five up until the age of 14, I grew up in the U.S. So my adolescence was mostly in the United States. Uh, okay, so I didn't so I grew up as a little American, <laughs> even though my parents were Belgian. And then we moved back to Belgium and I did my Ph.D. in Berkeley. So then later I went back and spent six years. OK, okay. OK. So I'm half and half. So yeah. I understand Americans because I'm half American myself. OK, <laughs> but also I'm very European. Yeah. Okay. Do you, shall we go into the political situation about what's going on in America? Are you, are ah, you okay, okay with touching on that? My view on that? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's an example of slaying demons. Okay. Exactly. So, so this whole, so I think it's, it's, uh, America had always this streak of irrationality. I think that, um, why the notion, the notion of government has to be small. That's very American. And I can understand that because that was the whole point of the founding of the United States, yeah. that they did not, that they, the Puritans, whoever they wanted freedom to develop the, how they wanted. And then they explored this wild country, West, uh, the West exploration, where there was no support from law enforcement. They had to defend their own house. So all of this gun, gun culture stuff, I completely understand that. Okay. Of course, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, you might argue that it's too exaggerated nowadays, but still it's a part of the culture. Okay, so that's not a problem for me. Uh, also, American culture is much more risk tolerant than European. So I can understand that. So Americans, they, they are much more likely to take risks than Europeans. And you can see that, of course, in economics and companies, lots of innovative companies. Whereas Euro com European companies are they're not bad, it's just American companies in general tend to be more risk taking like uh, startups and so on. It's not complete always like that. Huh? For example, Spotify and Skype were invented in Europe, in Sweden. So Swedish. Sweden is very, yeah. uh, very <laughs> high tech and other things. So I, there's companies in different, Europe, but, but, not, but America is at a different level. There are much more and they concentrate. There's all, they also are a very economically oriented country where material success is considered very important. Uh, this is since the 19th century. So I've been reading many uh, things, even in the 19th century, they were like this. Okay, this is not recent. They've been like this for 150 years. Okay, the United States. So Thomas Edison and so on. So, you know, it's very clear. So that um, economic success is very important. And they will do, they will take a lot of risks to get make economically successful. So that's good. That all gives lots of economic success. So that's the positive side. Of course, it's not all positive. Huh? So the negative side is that if you're not in this bandwagon, you're, you're out. Okay. So, so um, if you have a problem, if you have a medical problem, or, or you start with a big disadvantage, you start with very poor, or, or, or you're not white. Okay. Since 
Okay, this is the taboo thing. So slavery was part of the United States since the foundation. Okay, right. That's the original sin of the United States. Okay. Yeah. So if you are either non-white or not earning good money, or uh, or you got astray of the law, you have been a convict or something, then all of a sudden you're out of this beautiful American dream. You have you are living precariously in the United States. Okay, so but they but Amer but a huge chunk of Americans they accept that they say, in some sense, it's your fault. <laughs> okay, being poor it's your fault. It's because you're lazy. Well, that's not completely true. <laughs> or medical problems, it's sort of your fault. Well, no, being non-white is definitely not your fault. But that's the the philosophy. Okay, okay. Also a taboo thing. So this is clearly. Um, this notion that any kind of problem that you have in your life is your fault is clearly a Protestant notion. Huh? This is mm. Protestantism. This is if you look at the religion. So in a, in a, so this is the whole dichotomy, Catholic Protestant. The United States was founded by with a real Protestant. So there's good parts. The work, the work ethic, work ethic, strong yeah. work ethic. Okay, very good. But on the other side. Calvinism predestination, if you are unlucky, it's somehow God punishing you, okay? That, as many Americans would subscribe to that. Whereas in Europe, you have a much more Catholic, at least in the Southern part of Europe, which is all poor people must be helped, okay? You don't even discuss whether it's their fault or not. You help them, like the, 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 um, the Good Samaritan story, okay? Right. Whereas, no, but this is part of American culture from the beginning. So I'm, it has good and bad points, okay? So the bad point is that uh, rich people are highly valorized. They're highly admired in the United States. It means they're successful. God is favoring them. They work hard. Self-made man, okay? Right. Whereas uh, that's only partly true. They are building on a huge infrastructure around them. Right. To support. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and if and if you lose your job, you can be fired instantaneously in the United States. It's not possible in Europe. Huh? You can be out in the street instantaneously, and uh, and if you are in debt, which is a very American thing, then you can lose your health insurance. You can become a street person very quickly in the United States if you have some bad luck. Huh? And there's very little help for you there. It's not. There's my by far not the social safety net of Europe. So again, this is risk averse versus risk tolerant. Okay, the Americans would say you just have to get up and try again. Okay, fine, that's it. You have bad luck. Fine, you get up and try again. Whereas in Europe, you say people would say you need a minimum amount that people that the state will help you and give you a minimum, even if you have a lot of bad luck. That's not the case in the United States. By far not. Do huh? you do have social security, but? If you own a house, you will not get that. Sure. Okay. In Europe, you don't have to sell your house if you if you want to get some aid. Okay, so so this is the main difference. So right now, I think so that all of that is very reasonable up to now. There's not an issue. I mean, that's just a risk averse versus risk tolerant. Just I don't a have matter of fact, sort that. of. But yeah, what what I do have an issue with is the amplification of conspiracy theories and fake news and populism. Right now, the demonization uh, of left and right in the United States. So the extreme polarization. So this is getting worse, and this will get much worse before it gets better, in my view. So this is, uh, I'm not sure what started this, but there are people who are profiting by this and who do all they can to make it stronger and stronger and stronger, the polarization. Would, wouldn't this be media in the sense of creating this click, the media. click base, so right? A company like... Facebook is, of course, profiting enormously from this. Uh, right. uh, news propaganda chains like Fox News are profiting from this. So there are lots of people who are cynically profiting from this, and they don't realize how dangerous they're playing with fire here. Huh? Right. It can reduce the entire society into rubble. And, and, and so each side considers the other as a demon. And, and there are legitimate uh, critiques you can give in both directions. So... Uh, the, the whole business of wokeness and political correctness is way is is like a, is a form of tyranny which I find way too strong in the United States. Okay, cultural appropriation, 
who cares if I if I uh, if if my wife wears a colorful dress? She's not doing African appropriation. Okay, I mean, come on, this is this is way too strong. And of course, the 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 right wingers who do not like uh, government uh, and interference, they they sense that very strongly. So that's why. And the other direction is it's very similar. Huh? So the other direction, it's partly racist. Huh? You have to say it that. Uh, the demography is making the white population a smaller percentage, and the the, the Republican side is strong, feeling that very strongly. Right, and so they are doing the maximum what they can to eliminate, uh, to make voting restricted only to white people without saying it like that, huh? or to do gerrymandering so that the the non-whites would have as little as possible political power. So this is. This is so I have to say sorry on the right side it's mostly driven by racism but on the left side it's driven by this uh this fanatical fanatical uh utopic urge to go to this this communist not communist but, but forced forced utopia come on i mean that's also very that's also crazy okay oh, so the craziness is on both sides yeah. and it will not go away it will not go away. So something I am fearing, it will get much worse. So something is going to happen. It's going to, it's going to break open this whole thing. Okay. Right now, there is an easy peace on two sides, the two sides, huh? And uh, and luckily, the guy who was elected president before was an incompetent moron. But if he if he would have been smart, then situation would have been much worse, huh? Uh, in what way? Smart, well, uh, if he wanted to stay smart? president, uh, yeah. smart means uh, if he would have been much more intelligent in staying in power. I'm talking about Trump, huh? ah, I see. and not and not uh, uh, then if he would have actually used the mechanism of government to keep himself in power, declaring a state of emergency, giving direct command to all of the ah. the, the military, um, stopping the voting, stopping the count, really. Giving, putting soldiers around the the voting, uh, the buildings where they do the voting, and so on. I mean, really using the levers of government to stay in power. He would have stayed in power, and he would have been a dictator. Definitely, he is technically the commander in chief, and was so until twentieth of January, and he could have declared. I mean, sure, not all the army would follow him, of course, huh? But if he insisted and he put a lot of his puppets in the right places, it could have worked, huh? clearly. And he, he tried it, but in a kind of incompetent way. And still there was a um, this January 6th, uh, uh, whatever, what it, they tried to storm the Capitol, whatever. Right. Was, yeah. Was, huh? oh, come on. Jesus. In this totally incompetent way. <laughs> yeah. So I don't really get it. Uh, they are very, it's this, these guys are very incompetent. Okay. But maybe that's one. There are a lot of cynical people on the right, like uh, people like Mitch McConnell, whose only interest is staying in power. And they don't mind manipulating the populist sentiments as long as they stay in power. OK. Mm -hmm. And of course, they don't want it to actually overflow. Right. So, OK, under the hypothesis that that um, a nation state like Russia, who is knowledgeable in doing psyops and all these sorts of like sorts of you know techniques of influencing systems um do you think they would have the capability uh, to be able to infiltrate a place like america and use well, this the, sort the, of the infiltration is going on through the internet of course huh? it's not only the russians there is a huge so the internet is a huge amplifier and it's a, a, a it's a bunch of echo chambers with huge megaphones inside huh? yeah so it's very easy to manipulate that. You install a few trolls. You have, if you are determined and you have budget like a nation state like Russia, it's very easy. And not only Russia, there are. I'm sure that that uh, there are incredible numbers of trolls. There is the infamous Internet Research Agency in Russia, uh, which is uh, clearly uh, doing. It's just a sec it's a bunch of trolls. Huh? And the, and the 50 cent they have army a large too. influence yeah. and creating so the idea is to create as much chaos as possible but that's an internet problem we have to change the structure of the internet the problem is it will not go away until 
uh, until the internet is made um, much more resistant against this kind of thing. So for example, one way is that, is that you cannot use pseudonyms. Anyone who's on the internet must use their own identity and that this must be verifiable. Aren't that you, will aren't already you, mm -hmm. reduce a lot of the problem. Sorry, aren't, we were... you, aren't you reaching the point where now you, 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 you're starting to bring on this woke, forced utopia thing where you cannot you be yell anonymous. fire. Sorry, if you yell fire in, a, in an auditorium you're going and to it prison. causes a stampede and people die, it is your fault. Okay, so, so yes, you have to be, um, you have to, the only, there is the paradox of intolerance. Huh? You have to tolerate everything except for intolerance. You cannot, if you tolerate intolerance, you are, it, it, that, that doesn't work. That's self-contradiction and you will be overthrown. You have to be intolerant to intolerance if you want to be tolerant to the rest. So at some point, uh, using your own identity is that why is that dictatorial? I mean, yeah. At some point, there has to be. Um, you have to slightly reduce the 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 rights of people or to do what they want in for for social things. So I cannot take my gun uh, and go to a, a a crowd and start shooting over their heads. Oh, I'm shooting over their heads. I'm not killing them. Still, that is illegal, okay? So you would probably not argue that you would you would want to allow this, right, Stuart? So there is a limit, there is a limit, huh? And this is not a slippery slope to, to tyranny, yeah? There is a clear limit that everyone agrees on, okay? And of course, everyone wants to keep freedom and, and, and not go to tyranny, but, mm. there, but everyone also wants society to stay democratic, okay? So at some point you have to do something for that, huh? Yeah, I I want to go deeper into this concept of changing the internet because I think I right. a, a, a year or so ago I emailed you regarding to a, a networking protocol that I was implementing, which is designed to solve this particular issue. Uh, well, that's very good. I can only encourage that. <laughs> <laughs> but I did not actually read your text to detail. No, no, it's, it's okay. It's fine. Um, but uh, yes. Uh, but it introduces the concept. Good. It introduces the context, concept of uh, provenance to all data. Yes. So, so, so you can you can like you know every single piece of information on this internet is signed. So I'm able to yes. determine whether there's any misinformation, any manipulation of data. As no, as if there's misinformation, you know who did it. Uh, well, yeah. I don't necessarily know who did it. I just know that you didn't do it, um, that yeah. somebody but I'm else saying is... if, if, if I have an article signed by the New York Times, yeah, then whatever it says, I know that the, that is what the New York Times is saying. Ah, exactly. If, and if they have a good reputation of searching for the truth, then I can have confidence that the article is correct. Ah, this yeah. is, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I would agree. Providence is, is, there has to be, I would agree with that. Yeah. Providence has to be part of the basic infrastructure of every information flying in the internet. Right. So, I've, yeah, I've got that. Alex Jones, <laughs> if he invents a theory, fine. But when I see that theory, there's a, I know it comes from Alex Jones. Alex Jones, okay. Right, right. And right. I know what it's worth. Nothing. <laughs> okay. But if the New York Times presents a theory, then they have, of course, it all based, at the end of the day, it's based on your reputation in the real world, okay? Right. If I see the New York Times making a theory, they actually have built up a solid reputation over many years of doing fact checking, of trying to be very honest. Okay, so I will, I will believe what they say. Of course, they can break that reputation like anybody, but you need that. I think that's minimum. Providence, I would agree totally. You need providence. And it introduces yeah. another concept into the networking protocol, and that's the concept of data dissemination. Uh, which means second, someone is knocking at my door. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll edit that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so it introduces another concept into, into the networking protocol that is data dissemination. So the idea, mm -hmm. the idea here is that, is that uh, tech giants in the form of Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, they become centralized actors. They become rent seekers because in order to, for me to get your data, I have to go through an indirection of, of mm -hmm. a host. Right. And then as soon as you get that indirection, 
now I can start to get my VCs and I can scale up the, the high performance cluster, which suddenly gets cost expensive. And now I can control what data goes into and out of these, of my little uh, uh, node. Mm -hmm. um, I then can also run psychological experiments. For example, on Facebook, I can say certain sequence of, of, of um, uh, uh, posts might influence your in, uh, emotions in this way or might influence your emotions mm -hmm. in that way, which would cause yeah. you to get outraged. That's something I can give you information on too, but this whole business of manipulation using uh, technical means. I would like to hear that, but yeah. let me first, first, yeah. uh, and the whole, sure, point of, the whole point of introducing the concept of data dissemination into the networking protocol is that you, Peter, are able to disseminate your signed information to potentially across the entire globe mm -hmm. without having to rely on um, expensive uh, server infrastructure mm -hmm. because, because data is atomic and it doesn't essentially have a home because we've removed the indirection of the home. So as soon as the data arrives in your hand, I can just check your public it's key. All, but it's signed. So it's you signed. know who made it, but uh, apart from that, it lives its own life. That's right. It is a thing by itself. Yeah. Now, okay. but but uh, we're not all, we're not out of the woods yet, Peter. We're not out of the woods yet. Um, because there are many places in the world where there are tyrannical uh, uh, states. There are, there are places that if you Nothing get you caught- Nothing you can do about that. Well, there is, there is. Um, uh, by deploying a thermo the, the thermonuclear warfare of the cyberspace, uh, <laughs> the atomic bomb, which is a cryptography. So in other words, like I can, I, I build the concept of Diffie-Hellman into the networking protocol too, mm -hmm. by saying like, if, if I, there's only two packet signs, one is a request and the other is a response. Yeah, but and of course, these dictatorial states will not use your protocol. Eh? <laughs> oh no, of course, but the people, who I'm communicating, who live in this. They will be using it. Right. So as a result, the, the encryption will be able to um, uh, uh, shield them from these dictatorial states. Yes. Um, so the, 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 the states that are using these IETF protocols yeah. that are doing Diffie-Hellman and provenance, they will not be attackable by others, is what you're saying. They will be safe in the protocol that they are using. Is that no, what you're saying? Um, um, okay, no. So, so basically, essentially what I've done is re-implement TCP. Okay. And introduce the concept of, of prominence and data dissemination. You have to start by re-implementing IP, of course. Huh? Uh, but uh, Actually, this is yeah. also IP. It's also it's a re-implementation re uh, of IP. IP is a, yeah. It's, is it's, a, is a one it, thing. Huh? That's, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's replacing both of those, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And it, it, makes the con it makes your public key addressable transport agnostic okay but um so this is all good but if you want to make this work you uh -huh. have to write uh, rfcs you have to be involved in the ietf uh, there's a lot of grunt night work so i'm not a networking person um, i have i'm trying to push one of my colleagues olivier bonaventure who actually is involved in itf and has made internet protocols so he has done multi-path tcp for example right. i push him and i say Provenance, provenance. Mm, mm. I'm trying to push him. <laughs> Peter, I'm not going to go that way. Um, and the reason, and I have a different strategy for that. Uh, I'm okay. not going to do that because I've seen what the IETF have done. Okay. They've done a lot, but it it irritates the hell out of me, Peter. And okay. I, and just, just from the technical perspective, uh, let alone having to go through all of this stuff. Mind you, I know I can learn a lot from it. Um, but my idea is that uh, just another networking protocol is utterly useless. useless. Nobody gives no, a damn. No, you have to. No, how, you no need matter to create how a popular is. movement. Then you have to have a lot of popular support. I need to move the most valuable data, which is Bitcoin, on it. Bitcoin transactions ah. layer two. I need to make a transactional okay. layer on top of Bitcoin, and, and people then people will see the advantages of that, and then you will get more and more users. That's it. Okay. That sounds like a reasonable approach. Very good. <laughs> so you're working on that practically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, yeah. good luck. <laughs> so, so I'm I'm actually then interest, interested in following. Okay. What you do? Oh, there. Then I'll and I'll send through I stuff. I can put my minimal, uh, make minimal put some publicity for you using the small channels that I have. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I I should say that that I think you're... it's a very good. I think you're 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 doing 
You're no. fighting the holy fight. I think it's very good what you're doing. But I can I can I can say you are deeply deeply influential in 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 this because it's all your material, the distributed decentralized stuff that that just kind of goes in there, percolates, takes okay. years to go through. That's and conceptual. Like, it's all conceptual stuff. But no. I don't have a big media presence. Okay. Oh no, <laughs> and I am not. I'm not talking about that aspect. Like uh, what I'm trying to say is like I wouldn't have been able to do this without your writing, essentially. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if you want, of course. I'm I'm willing to brainstorm with you on this because I think what you're doing is very important. Okay, it's 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 it could be critical, and uh, and I hope that many people are thinking like you and are working in this direction, huh? Because it's yeah. a very it's crucial. Right now we're in a I hope temporary transit transitional period where the internet is too open and too it's still created according to the idealism of the. 70s and 80s we yeah. make it really open and and everything is wonderful the pioneer spirit you know? i wish i but, wish uh, but you need a little bit of uh of checks and balances on that huh? you yeah. do that's 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 life you do absolutely need it yeah. and it's not worth not taking away people's freedom to discuss or whatever we're just we're just ensuring that the uh, that the world will continue to be working in a reasonable way. Okay. Well, it's, it, it's kind of, issue. yeah, it, it, it kind of, it kind of like kicked in place after um, uh, uh, China started making moves towards Hong Kong like this. Okay. So, so I sort of not like only China. Oh yeah. In fact, China might not even be the most danger. I'm really worried about the United States and I think they are becoming more and more unstable. Okay. And this instability is not by far not over, okay? Mm -hmm. This polarization, something will happen. Either it will, in my, I'm actually somewhat pessimistic. Either this will start a war and either this war stays within the boundaries of the United States or it does not, okay? But there is something, the only way that this can end is by something violent. In my view, uh, it's, I don't see how it can be diffused. Uh, I mean, of course, there's a small chance that it can be diffused in a nonviolent way, but this would require a lot of effort by a lot of people pushing in that direction. And I don't see that happening right now. So, so far, I'm still somewhat pessimistic. I, I, I tend to agree with you I, yeah. uh, with, with regarding the states and, and what's going on there. To me, it's a, it, is, it is also like a ticking time bomb. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think... The, it's, it could it's be difficult. diffused, huh? but yeah. but that requires some some serious and long effort by a, se- a number of people. There yeah. are people working on diffusing it, but right now there it's not it's too small. The effort of diffusion is too small, of diffusing this time bomb. The thing is, it's it it kind of boils down to well, one of the major one of the major sort of fuses that are being lit is the, is the media. And, and now it comes down to like, oh, right, now are we going to lift up all of society onto an, a new communication protocol? How are you going to move such large amounts they will of people? Not, they will not come along. Exactly. Unless, of course, it's something like Bitcoin, where, where the governments are inflating the shit out of their currencies, turning it into toilet paper, and then Bitcoin is the only store, the, the yeah. thing of value. No, there has then- to be some kind of a, a threat. That's the only way yeah. to force things to change yeah they will they will not give up their power of manipulation willingly nope not at all have you read a book called morning of the magicians this is a book published in 1960 by lewis powells and jacques bergier a complete a, a, it's completely prescient this morning book actually magicians. this is actually a famous book uh-huh. this book started the whole new age movement. Oh, is that okay? so? Okay. And uh, which is most, a lot of it is garbage, but this book is not garbage. This book is actually very intelligent and very smart. And they, they um, are saying, they, I mean, they have many things to say, which is applicable to what we are now. I mean, in those days, 1960, they did not have that problem. Okay. But they are... Um, giving a lot of insight into how society works. So they have many interesting concepts. Like if you want to influence society, you have to go about it in a certain way, okay? 
And they give some examples of how it was done in the past. So they introduced concepts like the notion of a powerhouse, uh, which they define. They also explain, um, they're still very close to World War II. So they explain some of the underlying notions which caused Nazism to rise in power, mm -hmm. which are not widely known. The occult, it's an occult thing. So that's that actually, right. there's actually some, okay, if I, can, if I can summarize it in a slightly, maybe a slightly sensational way, but I don't know. It's the following thing. The human, the human um, psyche has a rational part and an irrational part, okay? Yes. And this is also true of society. So there's a rational part of society where people want society to work well, but there's also an irrational part, which basically wants to destroy things, which is irrational. And the, you cannot, if you repress that irrational part for very long, it will reappear in a, in an, in a stronger form and maybe in an undesirable form. Right. So the only way to get rid of that irrational part is to confront it. You cannot repress it, okay? So, uh, so this led to World War II. There was a lot of um, occultism involved in Nazism. Right? If you look at the history it's of true. Nazism. Yeah, this is what I but, know. Uh, but the only way we will solve today's problem, you cannot repress this polarization. You cannot force one side to go away. They will not go away. It will make them stronger. You have to bring it out into the open. Okay. Yeah. So the only way to solve the problem is to bring it in the open and do what it takes. So the only way to, to combat this very strong force of irrationality is by an equally strong force on the other side. It will not go away by itself. Okay. So it has to be brought in the open. So this is something people still have wishful thinking. This problem will go away. It will not go away, okay? The only way to make it go away is to actually take a sword and slay the demon, okay? Which means you have to fight. So that means the side of, of, of um, rationality has to fight, okay? It has to fight and uh, it will not otherwise go away. So that means life will get harder for us, I guess, huh? Mm -hmm. But it's important. Huh? Mm -hmm. I suppose you know. Actually, this is one of the reasons why I do these uh, these uh, indabas now. It came huh? from the COVID situation. Um, yeah, it's 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 just to sort of move away from these like you know bite-sized bits of information thrown out there on the internet. On Are you saying going into depth? Yes, that's exactly. one of the problems. Sound bites, what they call talking points yes. it's terrible Fuck. this eliminates all serious discussion okay <laughs> throw a talking point come on this is this is one of the problems and these are amplified of course huh? right right this right. is one of the things that is amplified by the the, the echo chamber megaphones huh? right right yeah and and aided and abetted by all of the big internet companies huh mm -hmm. they don't realize how how uh how evil it is what they are abetting huh? they don't realize for facebook it's just a question of making a little bit more or less money it, the serious is much it's much more serious than that huh? and i don't know if zuckerberg realizes it or if he doesn't care huh? but it's serious and also uh these companies even if they are neutral are doing evil okay they could even be doing much more evil by manipulating. I mean, it's very easy to me. Now, even if we're assuming that they are not manipulating, it's very serious, okay? It could actually be more, be worse. Huh? They could be uh, manipulating using uh, machine learning algorithms to create polarization. That's possible. Huh? Uh, for example... I think uh, that is the case. Emotional manipulation. So Facebook, a company like Facebook could... Uh, could create uh, riots huh? and revolutions by manipulating psychological manipulation. Huh? People don't realize it's like an atom bomb, Facebook. Huh? They are incredibly powerful. Huh? People still don't realize how powerful they really are. They are as powerful as multiple nuclear explosions, these guys. Huh? And nobody is checking them. Okay, this 
I think it cannot be repeated enough. Huh? Facebook, Google, Twitter, it's very easy. And all the satellites around, huh? there are so many ways to manipulate. Uh, one is simple example, which I saw, uh, which was at IRCAM. You can manipulate voice to add emotional content by changing the timbre. And if you do it with your own voice and you feed it to yourself and earphones, it will make you angry or sad or or um, Good God. happy without you even noticing it. Okay. And I've seen, I saw, this is a published paper. I can send you the reference to this. This is a small example of manipulation. Okay. Of course, Facebook with the resources it has, they could be controlling so much and we would not know. And there is no serious discussion of this. There's no serious investigation of this. These companies have, and of course they want to survive and increase their power. So if Facebook decides that they need to do this to survive, they will do it, okay? I think you, it has to be brought out into the open. This, so these companies are as powerful as governments with nuclear weapons, uh, these, these GAFA companies, huh? Yeah, GAFAM, yeah. Maybe you- not Apple because they don't have so much social network presence. But the ones that have social network presence are incredibly powerful. Right. And there is no check on them whatsoever. The small checks that exist are basically ridiculous. They are nothing. Okay. A few, a little bit of fact checking. What does that compare to a, a learning algorithm that manipulates sound and images? There's no comparison. Okay. No, that that would be a feedback into the fact the the the, the AI saying, yeah. "Oh, whoops, uh, there was a little bit of an exception throw. The people saw it. Uh, let's change the algorithm." <laughs> and even even people talk about the algorithm in YouTube. Huh? Huh? It it presents videos to you according to supposedly what you think. And yeah, that's nice. Uh, I have looked at Charlie Chan movies, which I like, and it brings more Charlie Chan movies to me. Great, I'm happy. But of course, it can be used in a much more uh, ill-advised way, this, uh, this algorithm. Huh? Specifically you can propaganda against business, different huh? states if they want to mobilize people. You can uh, send weird kinds of uh, conspiracy theories to people who are uh, sensitive to that in million, millions, hundreds of millions. People don't realize how powerful they really are. There's so much um, lip service but nobody, no government is taking action against these companies, none whatsoever. They are completely free to do what they want and don't believe that they are innocent. Huh? <laughs> oh yeah, Facebook, they just want to make more money. No, they want to guarantee they will survive. And if their survival depends on having power, they will do it. I think you have to be honest about that. Huh? If, one, if one thinks about the extent of in, in, in wartime operations, they would, they would print out pamphlets and drop them over the, the exactly. enemy. This, they are this... doing black propaganda or, or yeah. white propaganda. Actually, I've been reading books on propaganda. Let's hear it. This is very and interesting the reason, to me. Actually, very interesting book, a book by a guy named Paul. Let me very quickly check the book because you can get the PDF on the internet. Probably the best book that I've seen. This is called Psychological Warfare by Paul Leinbarger. Actually, this guy is famous because he's also a science fiction author, author called Cord Wayner Smith, but, but uh, under the pseudonym. But he wrote a very good book on psychological warfare. And his, the book was written around 1950s. And he was involved in all of the World War II stuff. He was actually, he was actually, his father was, um, 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 an advisor to Sen Yat-sun. <laughs> Can you believe that? And so he knows very well who is a well-respected figure in China by everybody, I think. Isn't that true? Huh? So, <laughs> Sun Yat-sun so he is knows, very famous. He too. knows his stuff. So you could, he will also give you the Chinese uh, uh, ideas on, on this. And so this is a very good book. And uh, so the reason I'm reading this, the main reason was to understand the, the deceptions used by, so for me to understand the UFO sightings, okay? Uh-huh. I'm reading a book on psychological warfare. But I think reading that in general is important for internet. People must be conscious that uh, techniques of propaganda are clearly being used. I mean, even if unconsciously, 
by Facebook, of course they're going to do things that increases their market share. By definition, that's propaganda, okay? Propaganda is presenting things that can be the truth, but uh, in a certain way or at a certain time. So you cannot say that they're not presenting the truth, okay? It's just how they present it. Yes. For example, I, you know, it's it's very interesting when when the COVID, the pandemic hit, right? Um, the first thing I did was to get knowledgeable people, try to understand the basic science of things. And then once you sort of get a handle on that, then you feel confident about, you know, I can reason with this. Then you start to hear the media nonsense starting the, to come through. The media through. is, and, and, yeah. And you even can, competent journalists are are only have a partial understanding. So yeah. you have to find honest experts, which do exist, huh? and not just conspiracy theorists who talk about ivermectin or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, even close friends are, are you know you can see them sort they of like in, they're it's getting it's very easy to be taken in by that. They get hooked by it. Uh, yeah, yeah. A few months ago, when I was in Sweden. There was a guy who, whose name I will not mention, but uh, who is a <laughs> professor in Sweden, who was who was studying very carefully the COVID thing. So he was all ivermectin, ivermectin, and so he was acting as if he, he, he was the world expert on COVID. The guy is not a uh, an epidemiologist, okay? He's not a medical doctor, okay? He's a computer scientist who is very smart and who thinks that because he's smart in one area that his, he is smart in all areas. That's a transfer fault. It's a fault of smart people everywhere. Okay? This is true. Uh, so, so you have to be very careful. So you have to be, uh, first of all, listen to the experts, real experts. And second of all, uh, more than one, okay, real experts. And second of all, uh, try to think for yourself too. And, not, and third of all, do not go to YouTube. <laughs> do not go to YouTube. YouTube is a mostly source of, of false information. No? Um, there are some, there are some, and it's very few islands of sanity on YouTube. For example, uh, for example, Dr. Uh, Dr. Campbell, um, he's, he's, he's an old school hard nose. But um, the problem with those guys is that they are in the minority. Okay. And, and it's so easy to fall of off these the guys, edge. Exactly. You have 50 conspiracy theorist people who have, and it's all very professionally presented. They look like professional newsrooms. See, the thing is, people take that as, a, uh, the, as validating what they're saying. The right. fact that it's professionally presented, that actually has zero to do with the, the quality of the content. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would, I would actually engage with Dr. John Camper. I'll send him a, an email, like right back in the okay. early days, and and uh, of a paper I'd find, and then he would like read okay. it, and then he would put it on his talk. He, but would... the guy is a doctor or an epidemiologist, or uh, no, no, he's actually he's he he was the guy that trains nurses to 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 do all of this stuff, right? And but then he, he works got... in a hospital. He was one of the 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 people working on COVID for decades on for the decades. field. He was oh, he the, was already the, retired. The... He's retired. He's retired okay. now. But, but he just had this education thing to teach people sure. about. But he was helping nurses and so on. So he, actually, he has real experience. So yes, yes, exactly. Most yes. these conspiracists, they don't. They just want to sell things. But more importantly, he's got the knowledge to be able to... He's also did a lot of research. He's got, a not, he's right. got the knowledge to re re understand these uh, uh, medical papers and uh, translate them into yeah. like language that we can understand. <laughs> it's hard. For COVID, yeah. it's hard because the experts themselves were learning about yeah. it. It was a completely new thing. Yeah. So they, the research was being done. Yeah. So, so the experts, of course, would change their views as they themselves learned more. And then people would use that as argument against them. Okay. Yeah. But that's because it's a new, you still have to listen to the experts, even if they are learning. Yes. They have much more uh, maturity in judging than you do, even if they are still learning okay yeah yeah oh geez peter it, it's it's just such a ride i mean i don't think uh, i hope we it's can come ride back. yeah <laughs> i hope we can come back to a it's world interesting where, times right yeah but i hope we can come back to a time when i can go over to belgium and see you again in the restaurant we had last time what remember? i would like to do <laughs> is travel around the world and and visit you in hong kong this will be after you retire and right and or before or after see ever since i got uh to be 60 years old I said, hey, and I had this very um, 
unhappy or uh, disgusting experience with an EU project. Oh, dear. The EU project evaluation. The technocrats. And the EU project evaluation. Oh, technically, it was very good. But uh, basically, the evaluators were extremely, uh, how would you say it? Um, maladroit in French. Um, um, ah, maladroit. Um, they were very, uh, not very psychological. And they were feeding us bullshit. And I had to smile. I was the coordinator. This is like Kona. So I was the coordinator of this project. And they were basically, first of all, they did not do the effort to understand what we were doing, even though they were on paper experts in the area. And two, they did not want us to talk about any of the science. They only wanted a few KPIs on what? innovation to judge. Now, this is the worst kind of evaluation you can think of. And second of all, they never gave us any positive comments, only critiques. Or they were silenced like sphinxes. Huh? They were silent. Or, or uh, whenever they said something, it was a critique. They were never saying, this is good. They were not never giving us any ideas. So a good evaluator would help the project. They're actually working together with us. These were not like that. So I have never swallowed as much shit in my life from, as I did from them. I was unwell for several days after oh the evaluation. And I said, no way, this was my, this is, if this is how EU projects, are going, uh, then then I decided I'm 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 out, out. now. Okay, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. don't want to do for now. I'm not doing any EU projects, so I decided to change the focus of what I'm doing completely. To to say, look, I'm 60 years old. I have a bunch of experience in different areas. Maybe the best thing to do is not to keep doing research, but to try to apply that experience to in a broader area. Okay. And, uh, and so that's what I'm doing now. So I'm working on building a bridge between uh, distributed systems and programming, even though it's, uh, it's pie in the sky long shot, of course. I don't care, okay? And not much money is in, in there. I don't care, okay? I'm also working on uh, thinking about the scientific method. So I have worked on, I have an article on um, how to understand the universe. So in my view, there are three ways to understand the universe. The scientific method is one way. So this is already quite worked out. Uh, is it published? Yes, not yet. No, it's only, I only have draft of it. But we could, uh, if, uh, if you're interested, I could send you the draft and you could give me feedback. Huh? <laughs> I so, don't think uh, I'm qualified at all. <laughs> or I don't know who could, somebody. I would somebody, like to read it for, for, in, okay. in, for in, interest sake. Also, uh, there is the, my interest in, in UFOs, uh, mm -hmm. which is not crazy. It's just that I want to take a step back and smell the roses a little bit. Okay. Why not? So I'm still pretty young, in good shape, uh, hopefully for a number of years. So I don't need to prove myself to the university anymore. Uh, I've reached the highest academic rank. Uh, I don't have anything to prove. I don't care about proving anything to anyone. I just want to do what I want to do now. Okay. So that's the, the point where I'm at now. And the EU project review was the thing that crystallized that. So that maybe was a good thing, right? Right. <laughs> it was not what they expected, probably. No. <laughs> uh? Oh, so, uh, yeah. I really don't like technocrats. So I have my view on how, what the problems, what, on Europe, huh? and how Let's Europe hear those two. And uh, well, let, uh, how are we doing time wise? I think we got like, oh, yeah, we got another like 15 minutes or so, or we can go even further. But like, uh, you're don't you think Europe is stagnating a bit, Peter? Yes, it is. And I think that, um, the problem is that it's in a, it's in a halfway point. The only way to go forward is for the, the member countries to give up some, some sovereignty to give more power. And the other way is that the, the government of Europe must be directly elected. So one of the problems is that the European Commission is not directly elected. They, that is the main governing body, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, Ursula von der Leyen, and they is the, the head of it. So this is, you can consider this to be the government of the EU, and but they are not directly elected. So there is an EU parliament, which is directly elected, which is very good. 
but the commission is named, is nominated by the member countries. So their bosses are not the people, but are the member governments who have put them in that places, who have given them this. So I, you can say many bad things about politicians, but an elected politician know, knows who elected them, huh? And he knows who he needs to make happy to be reelected. Okay, I think this is an essential property of government. Even though people love to complain, and especially in France where I live, they that's the life. French people, that's their thing. But still, they elect the government, and so the the government of the EU must be directly elected. Of course, the governments of the member countries will never voluntarily, right now give up right. such sovereignty. Uh, and um, also the other point is that EU must have, must, must be able to defend itself right now. The only reason, and this is my personal view, the only reason that the EU has respect from places like China is that France has nuclear weapons. But if France true. would not, so the UK also, but they're not in the EU anymore. Yep. There are only two countries on the European continent we have nuclear weapons, France and the UK. That's now, the language of politicians, nuclear, nuclear bombs. So, so if the EU, even though they have a huge economy, would not have nuclear weapons, neither Russia nor China nor anyone would take them seriously. Yes. Uh, of course, France is not going to use their weapons, but they have a, a serious deterrent force of nuclear weapons. Okay. And in my view, that is... Uh, the only reason why the EU is still taken seriously on the world stage. Isn't that people would, will not say that so simply. But I agree with e you. If France would not have the nuclear weapons, then EU would be a pushover and everyone would be pushing the EU in any direction they wanted. Uh, the, the United States now will treat EU as an equal because they have nuclear weapons. Uh, Russia treats EU, of course, they try to influence the EU, but they will not treat them as they treat the Ukraine, okay? Yeah. Which yeah. is as a, as a small pushover uh, to be pushed in any direction they want. They will not do that to the EU because the EU has real power, okay? And that real power is crystallized in the nuclear weapons of France, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. so, so Germany, of course, does not have any of that. Clearly, the... the even though they have a huge economy, they have by far not the power of the EU and that France has because right. of this. Right. Okay? It's interesting that Germany decided to give up so much nuclear, the nuclear uh, power they options. They were not what, deciding what? freely. Yeah, they were in a sense, but uh, it would not have been accepted by any of the major powers that they would go for nuclear weapons. Come on, after they almost took over the world. <laughs> Clearly, did, did I just did I just US have a little bit of a mental short over there? <laughs> short neither circuit. side wanted them to have nuclear weapons. Uh, they didn't want France to have nuclear weapons either, but France said, "Hey, I don't care." I mean, we're not going to have any more of that German the goal, nonsense. There, the goal <laughs> is actually was actually a very smart guy, uh, and he decided that the only way to not become a vassal of the United States is to have nuclear weapons, right. to be independent. And that's what he did. And I, I am completely convinced that it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but maybe I'm too close to France. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but now it's helping Europe. This French property of France, it's the only country in Europe that has this. Okay. Of course, there's NATO. But what is NATO these days? I'm not sure that NATO would do anything no. anymore to help what, anybody. What's your take on China? And 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 what's going on out here? Don't worry. I, I think I think I still have a few. I can maybe be five years before China. Hey, you want me to be brutally honest on China? I'd love to hear brutally honest on China. Keep in <laughs> okay. mind that probably I'm the one that's going to get locked up for Poor that. guy. <laughs> so, so no, no I'm uh, just of course, China. China is doing very well. Yeah, they are taking a place, a strong place on the world stage. Clearly, yeah. Huh? Yeah, and they are going to surpass. The United States in a certain number of years militarily. That's clear because of the population. Okay. Now, um, in terms of the, the government, so 
it's an extremely authoritarian government. Okay, this is, in my view, this is working for two reasons. I mean, I may be wrong. Huh? One is because the Chinese mentality, but also because, which, which respects authority, but also because as long as the people get richer, are better off, they will accept some reduction in their freedoms, okay? As long as they keep getting better off, which is the case. Their economy is growing very well. They're, they're becoming respected. But on the other side, China is very similar to Russia, okay? I can be brutally honest in Russia too. I don't know. Do it. So in my view, the Russians, they respect only one thing, which is raw power, okay? So the only, uh, if you do not, there's no civilization in Russia other than the respect of raw power, okay? That is my view of the Russians. It is extremely cynical, and but I think it's realistic. Okay, look what they did in Ukraine. They took Crimea, who cares? They financed the separatists in the east of Ukraine, who cares? They are, and it's the reason why the Soviet Union collapsed. So there were 15 republics, Russia was one of them. They never created a sense of community among these 15 republics. The Russians were always the overweight, always bullying the others. So the first chance they got, the others all went their own ways. None of them wants to stay with Russia. But, so that because Russia was only treating on pure power, they were never, it's not like the United States or, or other countries, which the UK, which have um, a lot of soft power, which have a lot of cultural things and, and they want to be friends. There's a lot of... Um, um... For example, the legal system, the UK, when, they, when the, England had a, a, a large colonial sort of attitude. They still in... have the Commonwealth today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Commonwealth is still an organization that has clout. Right. If, if they would have been such bad uh, overlords, that would have never been the case. So I mean, even sports, all of, cricket, all sorts of things. There's a large so, community. So the, sort of the British, that's because they are not barbarians. Of course, they did sometimes barbaric things, but they were civilized. They had a real culture, which they tried to transmit to their colonies. And there were some respect, even of course, they were, of course, not always. Uh, but, the, but enough of that, that the people would uh, like this British culture, okay? And the Commonwealth still exists today, absolutely correct. And the Queen is still formally the head of some of these countries. That would have that would never be possible with the Russia and the former Soviet republics. Huh? They all wanted to be as far away as possible. They, if they could, they immediately joined the EU. The worst, look at this. Remember the Warsaw Pact? The Iron Curtain? I remember it very well, of course, huh? since I'm old guy. Well. <laughs> The Warsaw Pact, and you know what NATO did? They're such assholes to rub salt in the wound. The NATO summit was held in Warsaw. <laughs> the Warsaw Pact countries. So Poland, of course, is now in the EU. Of course, Russia feels, feels threatened, but it's their own doing, okay? They feel threatened because they are bullies and they will only, they will only think of power. Okay, back to China. China is not as bad as Russia. They also are very power oriented, but they have the advantage of actually having a civilization, okay? Yes. They do have a long civilization with a lot, an enormous culture. And uh, this is the, a little bit their saving grace, in my view. I agree. Uh, and uh, of course, the current government is very power oriented, uh, but, uh, but it's not as ingrained in their national psyche as it is in Russia, okay? Russia, yeah. they will only do like this, okay? They have never had any other kind of civilization. Of course, they, they I mean, look, Peter the Great, the beards, all, all kinds of stuff, what they did in Siberia. It, it's, it's um, they have always, sorry, uh, sorry. They have always <laughs> been barbarians, okay? <laughs> I don't know if I can say it like that. Uh, of course, they have some culture and they have good writers and stuff, but in general, they are extremely barbaric. Okay, so mm -hmm. the Chinese is also very power oriented. Now, now they want, basically, they want respect. Okay, they want the world to respect them. 
and they're getting it, but but they are still acting too much like bullies. And that is not the way to have, to be like the British, to have a long-term relationship, okay? The British, look how much of the world still speaks English, how much of the world is still Commonwealth, how much goodwill they have all over the world. The Of course, India likes to complain about how bad this British overlordship was, and then they win the world championship cricket game, okay? <laughs> or Pakistan, okay? And, and English is still a big major language in India, uh, which, uh, of course, so, so um, and of course, the US is good friends of the UK. Sure. They used yeah. to be enemies oh, yeah, centuries yeah. ago. <laughs> so China will not have this unless they change. They will have be only limited to their own territory unless they change that attitude. Uh, it's up to them. Uh, so far, it's not looking good. They're looking very power oriented. Well, yeah. But if they want friends, long term relationship that lasts centuries, they sh don't. They should not treat people like get pawns in a power game the way Russia has done. Russia has no friends. All the former Soviet republics they hate the Russians. Okay. Yeah. And you know what they did in Kaliningrad? It's terrible. I mean, they forcibly. Uh, this was part of Prussia. You know, it's a piece of Russia inside of Europe, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, underneath the Baltic, the Baltic countries are so happy to be inside of Europe. They are so happy. And I know because I know people from these countries. Uh, I know people who uh, are professors in other places who are, uh, one guy is Lithuanian. And so they are, so, Poland also. They are so happy to be part of the EU <laughs> and NATO. And Ukraine is, is trying to be that way. Desperate. Okay. <laughs> but they are maybe too far east. Who knows? But uh, anyway, so what was I saying? So Kaliningrad was after the war. It was basically a present given to Russia. So they forcibly moved hundreds of thousands of people, German speakers, out. And they forcibly oh, moved hundreds of thousands of Russian speakers in. And... Uh, instantaneously became Russian, okay? And this was, as long as we were inside the Soviet Union, okay, fine. End of Soviet Union, it's a little, it's an exclave, you know, an exclave. Yes, when I went, when I went to Finland um, with my wife, we went on this, on a, a ferry across the way, and we looked at the map and I thought, what the hell, what's this? It's, it's a piece it's, of Russia. It's, it's, and of course, <laughs> and the Baltic countries justifiably are scared because it's a highly militarized piece of Russia. Sure. Yeah. inside of the EU uh, with water access with what exactly and with water access yes so so uh, yeah Stalin Stalin was a beast of power he was only he was only interested in power okay if you look at him all his actions can be explained by one axiom increase power uh, mm -hmm. there's nothing else human lives did not interest Stalin okay yeah yeah, I, I'm. I'm seeing. I'm starting to see some rather worrying signs that are happening out here in Hong Kong. Specifically, like youngsters are now choosing to leave Hong Kong, live, move to Taiwan. Why are they allowed? Because able to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, they. I think they. They. I think they can. But why do you go? I ask, and they say, "No, we want to fight the CCP kind of thing." So it's like a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, and also the fact that China will not let. Taiwan go. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Taiwan people themselves want to stay independent, but their opinion does not count, okay, whatsoever, yeah. zero. Yeah, well... Or, or maybe the China is afraid that if they let, they let Taiwan go, some of their own provinces will want to go too. Are they afraid of that? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, that I would think, be a sign of weakness, okay? I think... Like Russia, Soviet Union. Taiwan represents the the... The history, the untainted history before communism destroyed everything. Absolutely. Um, all of the all of the high-minded intellectual people, they all just buggered off to Taiwan and Hong Kong. And Taiwan's so, economic success today must be a big thorn in the side of China, no? They are very rich compared to per capita. Same for Hong Kong, huh? You guys per capita are like seven times the per capita GDP of a Chinese mainland person, huh? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's still true. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
but I mean, there's a lot of hard work out here. Um, but also, course, also from from a, from a strategic point of view, if China just takes Taiwan, they got that uh, T TCMS uh, TSMC um, f uh, chip fab. Sure, they own the world's chip fabs. So that's why. What does that do I to the that would U.S. Be the military? Only reason that the Western countries would not let China do that. Yeah, well, what does that do do to the U.S. military? You see, like which uh, manufacturers? You know, I, all... I'm sure the U.S. <laughs> behind the scenes said China. You can say what you want, but you will not actually go to Taiwan. And the reason is the technolo technology industry on Taiwan. Because all the Western Apple, for example, uh, mm -hmm. other companies, it's all coming out of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. All these foundries. Uh, it's true. Uh? Mm. And the media never talk about this, but I'm sure this is a major topic of discussion at the top level between U.S. and China. And the U.S., I'm sure, has made a red line there. It says, you can complain all you want, and they do it, uh, the Chinese, about Taiwan, but you will, and send planes, but it's all bluff. In my, my, my view, it's all bluff. They will not do it because the red line has been set by the U.S., and the Chinese believe that red line, okay? Do you think they the American, do you think, the, the since the Americans have given up so much of their work, at, well, can I say work ethic? They, you know, they're... they're ability to produce stuff and they've handed it over to china really do you think oh the actual manufacturing yeah well, manufacturing they will... do you do you think that there, there will be enough skill within america to be able to run these sorts of chip fabs you mean if you mean if they would not have taiwan anymore well yeah because i mean i th in the they, short it, term no they would not have it clearly not yeah. in the short term uh there would be major shortages of electronic basic electronic components and and the prices would go up uh, after a few years, it would take a few years, definitely, five, ten years. Uh, come on, look, Intel is now building their stuff in Taiwan. Intel cannot keep up in the fab. Uh, IBM, too, the Telum processor is seven nanometer. Taiwan is, is fabricating it. Come on. They are, they are the world's, the head of the chip industry now. Huh? Yeah, Isn't that yeah. true? That's true. Yeah, huh? It is. It is. As far so, as I know. So I'm, look, considering, so the Chinese, of course, they respect power and the U.S., even if they are uh, brainless morons, they still have a lot of power, okay? And they're not that brainless that they will not use the power if it's a vital interest that is, that is uh, threatened. So I'm sure the Chinese believe that. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, so far, Taiwan is safe. As long as that's like that, Taiwan will be safe in my view. <laughs> Anyway. Should we wrap this up, Peter? Yeah, it's been sorry a good about being so political. I hope no, that no. didn't destroy the rest of the meeting, all this <laughs> political pol politicizing. Uh, I think it's great. Good to talk about things. Peter, thanks true. so much. I really appreciate this. Things I look forward to, to seeing you in the open. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing you in person next time I come to Belgium or okay, you good. come to or Hong Europe. Kong. Or <laughs> Europe. We'll meet then, huh? <laughs> all right. Let me say goodbye. All right. <laughs>